In my late teens, I had this friend called Felix. Unlike my social anxiety ridden self, he was a social butterfly and appeared to know everyone. As such, I ended up knowing a lot of people by proxy and hung out with some interesting folk. The one I'm going to be talking about is called Carly. I was at Felix's place one night with a few people and we were all playing a game of Risk. We'd smoked a bit, and got to talking about some weird topics, compounded by the fact that we were all strange teens. You know, the usual. My buddy had crazy stories about getting struck at a radio tower. Another friend had stories about getting locked in a basement all night. I had my ghost stories, and it was one of the few times people believed me. So that was nice. Carly had the one we called bullshit on the most. She was your typical edgy goth girl, complete with clothes that would put a stripper to shame, and enough makeup that it had noticeable thickness. She was hot, I admit that. But we were distant friends, and I'd only hung out with her a few times with Felix. She seemed nice though, if a bit emotionally reserved. Well, this night, she up and states that she's an energy vampire. I had no idea what that was. And as I didn't really have access to a lot of internet in rural Newfoundland, she goes on to say that she gets energy from people's emotions. She can feel people's auras and she detects when people have issues. And she has to keep her emotions in check because she can get powerful. Me and Felix obviously call Bull as we had never seen her be powerful, and those claims reek of fake, coming from some edgy goth kid. She goes on and does a reading, where she's able to tell me about my emotions. I remember she rightly said I was depressed, but that isn't much of a shocker to anyone who'd met me, and told Felix he had a grave impending injury. His mum did have a stroke about a year later, for what little that might be worth, but she also said some other vague things to the rest of the people we were hanging out with, which were probably correct, but I don't know. Finally, after this had gone on for an hour or so, I called her bluff. I asked her where she got her mystical powers. I remember asking if her dad was a warlock and her mum a pixie. She says she was taught by Mother Hilda. That was the most bull name I've ever heard, I said. Where the hell does she live? Up your ass. Becoming visibly distressed, she said to me and Felix, who were laughing, that she could bring me to meet her next weekend. Thinking she would bring me to one of her weird goth friends who would try to do some edgy stuff, I was always down for a laugh and said yes. Felix was down as well, so it was settled. Now it's important to know that I have an issue with being a passenger in cars. I fall asleep almost immediately while not driving. If I'm lucky, I can make it five minutes, and that's a miracle. It's really important to remember this, because I sure as hell wish it wasn't the case. So when the weekend comes, me and Felix and Carly all get together to go meet this person. I had assumed it would be some person that we would meet in the basement of her parents' house. But Carly says that Mother Hilda lives on the Bonavista Peninsula. That's a good three hours drive away in good weather from where we are. So I was frankly more angry that she didn't bring snacks. So we all got in the car. She had gotten her license already since she was six months older than us. And we set off. In my true fashion, I fell asleep within minutes. And I don't think we even hit the highway before I was out. When I had woken up, we were driving on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. For those of you who haven't been to Newfoundland, I think my wife put the Bonavista Peninsula best. It's like you're walking on the graves of a million really pissed off ghosts. Gloomy skies, gloomy landscapes, and a real feeling that someone is watching you from the tree line where you can't see them. I frankly hate that place. Most people I know from it are great, 
but everyone who I know who lives on it is miserable. So I come to, and we're driving down this poor excuse for a road, and what could be more aptly named a goat path? So I immediately start complaining. Where the hell are we? Why are we here? What are you planning? You know, reasonable questions? To all these questions, she just answered, Mother Hilda will answer. In the tone of a psychopath. Felix doesn't say a word, and just looks mildly amused. So after what felt like forever, we come to a clearing. It is really just a place where the trees aren't that big. In the middle, sat an old school Newfoundland box house in absolutely horrible condition. Like, no one had shown this house a lick of love in over a hundred years kind of run down. It still had windows, but the roof looked like it was attempting to threaten the ground with its lean. I remember the place was blue, and the goat path didn't reach all the way up to it. It stopped a hundred feet shy. Carly stopped the car, gets out, and like a psycho says again, Mother Hilda will answer. I look to Felix, who has the biggest grin on his face. He's high as a kite. I berate him, as this is horrifying, and his only real response getting out of the car is, you're a better man for me than doing this sober. So I get out of the car with Felix, who insists that I go first. My only thought is that I am going to meet the end. Carly walks through the trees with her arms outstretched in a tea pose, spinning and singing. Mother Hilda knows all. Felix looks at me and says, we're getting ended, aren't we? Carly reaches the door, opens it up and motions for us to come in. Now I saw two options, either go in with the witchy woman or brave the untamed wilderness of rural Newfoundland in who knows where. I decide the latter, as that one only has a chance that I don't perish and no one finds the body. I reach the door, and the place is pitch black inside. It was a generally overcast day outside, and the windows must have been covered in paper or something. Not freaking furnished. No lighting, just rotting boards and the smell of my impending doom. I can hear Carly laughing upstairs, because of course there's an upstairs. So I think, yep, this is where I meet my maker. This is a house where she does her weird rituals. And I can tell Felix is thinking the same thing, but he insists I go first. Thankfully, the stairs were next to the door in the front of the house so I didn't have to risk walking through that creepy place. When I look up the stairs, I nearly wet myself. At the top is a girl naked and pointing down the upstairs hallway. She has makeup like Carly, thick and dark and is staring at us with intent, evil eyes. I turn to look at Felix when the girl at the top of the stairs belts out in a voice louder than I'd peg her to have. Mother Hilda doesn't wait. I was so petrified. I walk up those stairs, and the place was eerie silent. I hadn't really noticed it before, but there was no sound of the wind in the trees, no birds chirping, no rustling, and no floorboards creaking. I started to get those really nasty vibes. Felix flashed me a hunting knife he brought along with him and whispered, I got you, we're leaving alive. Feeling 0.1% better, I reached the top of the stairs. The girl, who was maybe 14, ran into a room on the upper floor, and I saw Carly at the end of the hall next to a door, what I assumed to be a closet. She had the biggest grin on her face, like a proud child about to show their mum a Play-Doh figure they had worked on all day. I walked closer, and with all the manly gusto I had in me, made it five steps in the hallway. I had the feeling that I was going to puke, 
and every fibre in my being was telling me whatever was behind that door was danger. Pure danger. Carly looked at me and said, Mother Hilda will see you now, and opened the door. What was inside was what I believed to be a small child. Its back turned to me, and was eating something in the closet. I remember seeing chicken bones at its feet, which were huge. It was wearing a ratty red shawl, and was arse naked below the waist. And that's when I noticed it was an old person. It had that typical saggy old person ass, the one that lacks all tone and definition. I was watching this thing turn around, and it was the scariest sight of my life. It was some kind of old woman, but I questioned that frequently given its appearance. It had tiny, tiny arms, like an infant on a toddler's body, that was holding her shawl up. It had wispy angelic strands barely holding onto its head, and a noticeable hump on its back. I assumed I noticed this, because its face didn't make sense. It was teeth, just one big mouth with hundreds of misshapen teeth. The entire face looked like it had been scooped out and just given teeth, rows upon rows. I saw no eyes, no nose, no forehead, just long, creepy teeth. It snarled and yelled, No men. I passed out. When I woke up, I was back in Felix's house. Him already up and staring at the floor with a thousand yard stare. I asked him if I had some kind of weird dream. And without missing a beat, he says, Mother Hilda is real, man. I thought it was a creepy fake thing but I saw it too. We spoke for about 30 minutes about what happened, and we basically had the same recollection of events, except Felix saw her move a step or two closer before he blacked out. I said I should go home. He said I should leave, and we both went our separate ways. Over the next few days, I tried to message Carly back in the days of MSN, but the only response I ever got was, Mother Hilda never forgets. After three days of this, about 10 messages a day, I say to Carly, I don't need that in my life, and I never hung out with her again. Although I did see her from time to time in school, but she refused to look at me. I had only one more encounter with Mother Hilda, or whatever the hell she is. I had quite a big yard before the river, and had a sizeable fire pit where I would have fires. Having Felix as my only real friend, I had many bonfires alone. That was fine. I enjoyed the spectacle of it all. So one night I was having a fire, and started to get really into it. Flames were perhaps 15 feet high, and I was having a great time. I'd whipped off my shirt, placed it by the six foot poking stick, and had begun chanting in gibberish. I don't know why, but it was a conscious action. Teenagers are weird. On the other side of the fire, through a line of trees was a smaller path my neighbour had to go to the woods. I catch a glance out of the corner of my eye. There's something small in the trees. Thinking it could be a wildcat or perhaps a baby bear, I stop to look at it. From the other side of the line, I see Mother Hilda her gaping more wide open and facing my direction. I go to scream, as is a logical action, but Mother Hilda yells, No! And my raging inferno goes out. Not even an ember stayed lit. Cold, dead fire. I looked back. No Mother Hilda. I decided that was enough of that. I booked it to my house as fast as my legs could carry. When I get inside, my mum asks me why I'm not having the fire anymore. She rarely cared what I did, so I asked why she wanted to know. My mum said that the nice girl who wears black asked me about it maybe five minutes ago at the front door. Mum had told her I was having a fire, and she started to walk to the backyard. I go to my room, horrified, and message Carly on MSN to demand what the hell. 
I shouldn't have gotten an answer, since she had just been at my dorm, but I did. Mother Hilda likes you. I haven't really told anyone this story before now, as it's one of the more outlandish ones, but my friend Felix still won't talk about it. I met him a while ago when I travelled back to Newfoundland, and asked him if he remembered Carly in the creepy house. He just looked at me and said with dead eyes, Mother Hilda is real man, don't mess about, and walked away. I still have yet to make sense of it, like a lot of things that have happened to me. Just over 10 years ago, I was fresh out of college, and had moved back to my parents' house for the free rent and food for 9 months or so, before I was leaving the state for graduate school. Now my parents are super chill, and gave me my own space in the house, but being a 22 year old single guy, and living at a house in the sticks, as they had recently moved about 40 miles south of a major midwest city, is certainly not ideal. But I didn't have any other options, so I started looking for some work, to pass the time more than to save up money. Anyway, so summer turned into winter, and I still hadn't found anything solid. But by then, I desperately needed to spend more time out of my parents' house, so I took a part-time gig doing some light bookkeeping for a small business owner my dad knew. I didn't really want to do it, since it didn't pay much, but it was short term, and wasn't even a real office setup. But again, my parents lived in the middle of nowhere Midwest, think acres and acres of farms, and I knew I had limited local opportunities to make some cash, and this guy was going to pay me under the table as well. About that time, a friend of mine in the city said that if I had just paid him 200 a month and helped clean up, he'd have let me crash in his living room until I was ready to move out of state. That was all I needed to hear. I took the job. So my dad's friend's family had a construction type business. They helped out with building stuff, but it was more ultimately focused on renting out a few bobcats, and larger argas they owned, and other various drills and then odds and ends like generators, and other low level construction or farming equipment that someone in the area couldn't afford to purchase, but needed to use from time to time. This was a small mum and pup style thing, where everyone knew everyone, and the office only opened on days when someone was coming by, and was just generally a mutually beneficial situation for the business owners and the locals. Since I had minored in a business adjacent area, and my dad recommended me, they trusted me to go in there for about 15 to 20 hours a week, and check and file the rental forms, make sure nobody missed payment days, and if there were payment plans in place, answer an email or two, and talk discussing prices and availability. Super easy gig. The old building where I worked, was 90 years old, and on top of this little hill, and the downstairs used to be an old country bar until the 70s, when this family bought it cheap, cleared out the bar, and fenced in the property to use it as a parking lot to store all their rental equipment and gear. I could generally come and go as I please. I worked any hours I wanted to, as long as the work was done. So if things were slow, and there weren't any rentals for a few days, I'd usually go in after 7 and stay until around midnight or 1, since I knew I'd be alone, and could listen to music out loud and take my time. The office where I worked was on the second floor of the building above the old bar, and looked out onto the long driveway. From my seat, I could easily see out the window, and once or twice saw a family of deer or a raccoon scamper by, and I always glanced out when I saw movement, since it was very noticeable. It was incredibly remote, very still and quiet, so if something unusual occurred, or if something felt off, I definitely noticed it. One night during winter, it had snowed a few inches, and my dad told me to stay in, because the roads were bad. 
but I had an old SUV, and more than that just really wanted to get out of the house. So I went into work at about 8pm, and was going to stay until just after 1. I always left the gate open at the bottom of the hill, since, believe me when I say, nobody ever showed up at night, since we were literally in the middle of nowhere. I think the nearest occupied house was about two miles down the road, and to even turn onto our short road, you had to only be coming to our specific building and probably knew where it was beforehand. It was a locals only type thing, and very small, since the family had inherited a lot of money, and kind of did this rental thing on the side. Basically, someone would never just get lost and end up at our building. So I'm jamming away to some Fallout Boy. Everyone makes mistakes when they're young, and having some coffee, and kept glancing at the snow outside here and there since our one orangish street light was reflecting onto the ground at the gate, and was causing the light to shine off the snow in a really cool and pretty way. At one point around midnight, I went downstairs to the big bathroom to do my bathroom business, and then came back upstairs and got settled into work. I probably did about five minutes worth of work, when I glanced outside and saw a huge imprint of something in the fresh snow, just below the light. It seemed like it must have been a huge dog or substantial animal had rolled around on the ground there. Since I didn't notice it just 15 minutes before, it had to have happened when I was in the bathroom, or perhaps when my back was turned, since I would have seen that type of movement for sure. I shook it off and assumed a dog or maybe even a farm animal, as it was common in this type of area. I assumed it gotten loose, and maybe was attracted to the light. Who knows? At around 2 in the morning, I was getting ready to leave, and as always, got out of my car to lock the gate up, and I'll be honest, I had pretty much forgotten about the imprint in the snow. But when I looked down, I was shocked to see that it wasn't just some disturbed snow, but the undeniable imprint of a human-made snow angel. If you don't know what a snow angel is, it's when kids lie on their backs in the snow, push their arms and legs back forth, so when they get up, it looks like the outline of an angel. I used to do this when I was a kid, so I 100% knew for sure that's what it was and it was deliberately made underneath the light post. But it wasn't from a kid. It was from a very large person, or at the very least a normal sized adult, wearing tons of layers of big winter clothing. I looked up and saw what I already knew, that whoever had made this snow angel could have easily looked up and seen me through the window, so they must have waited for me to head downstairs to make it. Now I definitely would have seen or heard someone drive up to our building, even if I was in the bathroom, so I knew someone had to have walked up in the freezing cold snow for miles, stopped in front of our building, did a snow angel in the small amount of time I wasn't sitting in front of my desk, and I glanced around for tracks in the snow, and saw that there was one set that led to the nearby woods right out of the building so it was clear the person didn't use the road, but instead came from the opposite side, which made me instantly uneasy, since that side was just trees and darkness for miles. I was definitely a little freaked out now, once I realised that someone had just been this close to me secretly in the middle of the woods, and I looked around but didn't see anything amiss at all, and now I just wanted to get the hell out of there. When I got back in my car and drove a few feet, I realised my boss would be there in about four hours, and might see the snow angel and assume I did it, since he probably assumed I kept the gate locked when I was there. It wouldn't have been that big of a deal at all, but I was young, and felt like I might be made fun of by him, if nothing else, as they were all manly men, and I liked books. So I opened the gate back up real quick, ran over and kicked the snow around so it hid the angel, locked it up, and went back to my car. I wasn't exactly fully terrified at this point, even though it was certainly unsettling. 
I just thought it was really weird and could have been an illegal hunter, even though hunting in the night in the cold didn't make much sense. Regardless, the imprint was made two hours earlier, and I assumed that they were gone. But that's when I heard it. When I was getting into my SUV, there was the loudest high-pitched laugh coming from the woods. It almost sounded like a fake laugh, like how the witch in The Wizard of Oz would laugh or something. Like, someone was doing it on purpose, to show they weren't scared of me, or how I'd react all at once. I knew they were laughing at me, on our property. It was close enough that I knew that they could probably see me. But I couldn't see them, since, other than the street light, there was no illumination. After a few seconds of laughter they stopped, and then it was just silence everywhere, except for my heart beating through my ears. Then the laughing started again, louder this time, more like screaming and laughing combined. I sort of froze for five seconds, listening in a panic. Now I spent a lot of time in that area, and I knew what coyotes and foxes sound like at night with their high-pitched screeches during mating season, so I can't completely logistically rule that out. But to me, it honestly sounded like an adult man trying to emulate a woman laughing, like someone who was deliberately trying to make a fake, scary shriek laugh in order to scare someone. And it worked. After those five seconds, I was filled with adrenaline, got into my car, and drove the hell away from there as fast as I could without sliding off the road. Back at home, I was up all night trying to figure it out, and told my parents the story when they awoke. After talking it out, we decided it was one of two things. It was either my brain somehow convincing myself that the snow formation was angel-shaped, when it was really just caused by an animal. And then the snow tracks and laughing were just a coyote or red fox. Though I don't think that's what it was. What I truly believe is the second thing. Which is that some local was out walking around for some reason and decided to mess with me. I didn't have any close friends left in the area that would do this. And if they did, they certainly would have brought it up to make fun of me for speeding away in terror. I found out later the nearest house was a super old couple so I highly doubt that it was any of them. Which means, whomever it was, went out into the woods in the night, in the freezing cold just to mess with a stranger. I don't have any mental issues, family history of them, don't do drugs, but I do drink socially, but I didn't that night. I also don't believe in the paranormal, so I never once gave it a thought. I know in my heart, someone was out there. I worked there another six weeks or so, and never had a single issue. Though I know where my boss kept his gun, and I always made sure it was there when I started my shift, and I certainly always locked the gate from then on. Thinking about this experience that night, the part that freaked me out the most was that he'd have had to have waited around for me to leave for about two hours just to do that laugh. He didn't know me. I could have been crazy, and the type of person to get mad and try and find him and attack him. Yet he didn't seem scared, or care, while he tried to mess with me. For some random dude, this is probably a story he tells from his point of view, to somehow make his friends giggle in hysteria. But for me, that dude, and the one I call Angel and the Snow Guy, the one with the laugh I'll never forget, Let's not meet. This was probably around four or five years ago. Four friends and I had been talking about ghost experiences and such, when we decided to try and find some places to go investigate for fun. A quick bit of research revealed some stories about a place called Old House Road. Claims of a witch green lights from the ground, and a ghost ship that sailed over the beach and anchored. We decided to take the three-hour drive to go visit. The road itself was probably a mile and a half, maybe two, gravel road, 
surrounded by grass and weeds, and plants at least six foot tall. It's right by the water, a little private beach. On this road, perhaps two thirds of the way, is a little old abandoned house, and there was not a single source of light on the whole stretch. So we drove down all the way, noting that it's pretty dark here. We parked by the beach, stepped out, and walked as a group towards the house. We take a couple of turns and such, before we reach a long straight way to the house. We're walking and talking, searching for things with our flashlight. When someone points out a light in the distance, this light, we all observed, was down near where the house was, but directly in the path. We kept walking, slightly cautious now. This is when we realize that the light is getting closer than we expect. We stop, and the light continues to come closer. It's at this point I observe that it's not like a flashlight or a car light. This is a torch, or a lantern, swaying slowly back and forth as it approaches, and it's not illuminating anything behind it. My friend Jay is the only other one in this group that has experience for searching with things like this. He taps me on the shoulder and whispers, Shark attack. He meant that the lantern was a distraction. So we both turned around, just to see two small red lights peering over the tall grass, before quickly dropping back down into said grass. At this point, everyone else is transfixed on the light ahead. So me and Jay calmly turned everyone around, and said tonight is not the night to be messing with this. We got everyone back into the car calmly, before we explained what we'd seen. Once at the car, I decided to step back and see if anything had followed. I walked towards the first turn, where I could still be seen. I heard some movement ahead, and said hello, and promptly got hit by a rock. Not hard though, it was on my knee. I was more confused than anything. I received another rock. And this time it was to my chest. I got the message. It means get the hell out. So I go back. We all go into the car and decide it's time to return home. It's worth noting that on the drive down the road, we saw absolutely no sign of lights or people or anything. Just the same empty road we'd taken to get there. We left Old House Road shortly after. At this point, we discussed the fact that we drove three hours to spend 15 minutes in one spot. Consensus was, screw that. So we looked for a place that was in our own path home. And boy, did we find something. I will probably never remember the name of the bridge, but I'm sure I could text Jay and find out. The place was an overpassing bridge in the middle of nowhere on some side street that was probably 15 miles long. We drive over there, someone reading the claims out to everyone. The story goes that there was a bride who ran from her arranged marriage on her wedding day, running over the bridge, stopping and jumping off in her wedding gown and dying. Neat, right? Coupled with that, was very factual and documented evidence of KKK activity in the 70s. They'd hung many people on this road, hanging off trees right next to it. So, not cool. What were the problems, you ask? They say that if you parked your car under said overpass, you could hear the bride fall onto your car, see handprints on your mirrors, but see no corpse. They also claimed that if you parked there, your battery would die, and car would become inoperable. Tow companies came out a lot apparently, 
and further down the road, people claimed seeing dead men hanging in the trees. We go down the road, and this overpass is nestled neatly in the lowest part of the valley, made by two moderately sized hills. You can see the top of another side around the bridge. Not very intimidated, we made the decision not to stop under the bridge, for we were all hours from the house, and just decided to screw that. We drive under it and saw nothing. It was very uneventful, so we continued down the road. I can't explain how dark this road was. No street lights, no signs, no anything. Just dense woods on either side of the street. As unsettling as that was, we found a little wider dirt shoulder, and turned around maybe a third of the way down the road. Back under the bridge we go. Pass number two was interesting. We go down back the hill and past the bridge. As we do, the car lights are very noticeably dim, and then come back. Everyone saw it. Intrigued now, we U-turn, and like typical young people, we drive down once more. This time the car audibly stutters, and we all feel it. Well damn, we U-turn, cross the fourth time, and the car radio shuts off, and the car almost completely stalls. This is the point where we should call it. It's close to the witching hour. We've already had an encounter, and the car is threatening to die on us. But alas, we're dumb. So onwards we go. We drive, and as we're approaching the bridge, we see headlights on the other side. So we stop, feeling slightly compelled to. This is where it gets weird. We had a couple of people recording at this point, and we all are very distinctly pointing out two pairs of headlights descending the opposite hill. Four, in total. This man is not wearing a uniform or badge, but is driving a local police vehicle. He rolls down his window, and stops. No blue lights. He tells us that they've been monitoring our traffic patterns since we'd been there and told us it was illegal to be driving back and forth on this road like that. Top that all off, he just seemed abnormal. His facial expression was fairly locked in place. He spoke very slowly and deliberately, and it was just off-putting. I apologize, but it's hard to put into words. It just felt wrong. Regardless, he told us to leave and then watched us three-point turn, and then go away. He drove off, with us behind him until the stop sign. He turned right, and GPS told us to follow him. When we do, he's gone. We were very shaken. We stop at a gas station for snacks and nicotine. We exchange a review or two of the three videos recorded, and point out the distinct four lights. But, the back two that disappeared when they reached the bridge, weren't connected like headlights. Almost like it were two motorcycles. If I ever get the chance, I'll get someone who might have the video and upload them. But that's a good one. It got to us, and we didn't go out like that again. But I do joke around, about going to Old House Road again sometime. I've always worked for security companies. You name it, I've done it. Private venues, events, buildings, and now lately, dilapidated structures. I was in charge of looking after this building at night. I don't even know why they needed security. It was grotty, it was dingy, and it reeked in certain parts. Without a doubt, animals had got in and never found their way out, and the stench of their corpses rotting around the building were incredibly off-putting in the summer heat. 
Let me give you a bit of background. This building that I worked in was in the most remote part I had ever worked. Most of the time, I had to work in the city. But the guys I worked for told me about this opportunity. It was far out and about an hour's drive, but the pay was lucrative and well worth the effort. I would be working from 7pm to 7am. The job? Ensuring no one broke into this busted down building. I tried asking for details about why they'd want to keep this place after going there a few times. But my employers could not or did not know the reasons. This place, as I said before, was nothing special. In fact, it was an eyesore in the middle of the forest. I don't know what it was before. It had been well gutted, and any traces of what it could have previously been had obviously been removed. To me, it was just the decaying shell of a building. I still am itching to know what was there before. It spurs my interest. And when I was doing my rounds, I'd look about to see if I could find bits of paper documentation or anything like that. Usually, when companies close down buildings, they don't even bother removing the contents. They just close it, and whatever's left inside is left there. I've been in buildings plenty of times, with loads of files and information, sometimes even electronics, that they've just blatantly left to rot forever. But, in this case, there was nothing. I was doing my rounds as usual, having only worked there for two weeks. This was easily one of the easiest jobs I had ever done. All I had to do was patrol twice a night. It's not like anyone was here to check up on me anyway. But I did my patrols, made sure everything was good, and would just scroll through my phone, reading, listening, doing all kinds of stuff. The night was my own and this hardly felt like work. However, through the sea of cameras that I had in front of me, checking on all the decay, did something flash on the top right most monitor. There was movement. The movement was definitely human. This person moved, almost glided across the screen. I saw this person, and in a blink they were gone. I'd only caught them a little too late, as I had been browsing Reddit. I checked the section, and knew exactly where they were, not three minutes away from my station. So I grabbed my flashlight, and quietly made my way round, seeing if I could hear anything. When I reached the area, I patrolled as quietly as I could, and found nothing. After not finding anyone or hearing anything, I resorted to shouting, telling them that they were on private property, and that if they didn't reveal themselves now, I'd call the cops. Empty threats, but sometimes you have to employ these. There was nothing. I searched for a good 20 minutes in vain, and this site was absolutely huge, so there's no way I was going to invest more time and retreated back to my little hideout, monitoring the cameras more carefully this time, but for the entirety of the night, I didn't see a single thing. Weeks passed without incident, and the previous event had now, in the back of my mind, been labelled as a blimp, something that I had obviously misseen while browsing my phone, and left it at that. It was around this time that after I was relieving Robbie from the day shift, did I strike up a conversation with him. We usually chit-chatted a little bit, but I had arrived a little bit earlier than anticipated, with there being far less traffic on the road, and we started talking. He was just getting ready to leave, when out of nowhere he looked at me and said, Have you ever seen something? in the camera. I didn't reply, and gave him a quizzical look. He continued, I've seen some things, man, in the morning sometimes. I don't know. 
He looked down at his feet, started rubbing them against the floor, grabbed his bag, and without another word was gone. Was he just telling me this place was haunted or something? I tried laughing it off, knowing full well in the back of my mind that I had seen something, but chose to keep that to myself. I didn't want him to think me mad. A few weeks down the line, and nothing eventful had happened. All that I knew is that I had this job, and it was super, super easy. But it was on this night that everything changed. I was doing my rounds, and as I was walking down a decaying hallway, did I hear something? It sounded like laughter. The laughter of children. At least two or three. Now, I've had my run-in with urban explorers in other places, but never here. But who the hell would bring their children in the middle of the night to a decaying building? That is beyond me. I ran and screamed for them to stop, running in the direction I swore I heard them in. When I reached it, it was just an empty room. I listened, and I heard them again. This time, they were in the direction that I had just come from. Now, to describe this place, I was in a corridor. There was only one way to get to the room I went to, and unless they passed me in the darkness and were completely immune to my flashlight illuminating them, there was no way I could have missed them. Upon running that way, I made extra careful to ensure I looked everywhere, and told them to stop. When I reached the room, nothing. Again. I was becoming very scared at this point. Twice I had heard children laughing, and the sound of young feet hitting the ground. I'm not gonna lie, I just about wanted to pack up my stuff and go home, so I quietly began making my way to the stairs. That's when I heard it. Footsteps, just footsteps, coming from above me. They were running down at speed. Fight or flight kicked in. Was I gonna confront this intruder? Hell no. I grabbed my flashlight tightly in my hand and bolted it down the stairs, jumping two, sometimes three a go, trying to make my way to the bottom as quickly as I could. I ran out, hit the ground floor, flew out the fire exit, and didn't look back. I heard the door slam shut as I made my exit, and not three seconds later did I hear it slam open. It was with such force that it hit the back wall with a loud smack. I didn't stop running. I made it to my car, switched the engine on, and was about to peel out of there when I looked around. There was nothing. I made sure my car was locked up, and waited in silence just to check. Had I imagined it? Surely not. But I sat there, sweat dripping down my back and neck, in utter terror. I think it took me an hour before I felt safe enough to leave my vehicle. Thoughts plaguing my mind of the intruder hiding behind my car outside my field of vision, waiting to jump me the moment I exit the safety of my vehicle. When I did leave, I looked around, there was nothing. I went to check the door, which had slammed with such force, I was sure it had broken off his hinges. But when I went to check, it was closed. There didn't even appear to be a dent in the wall as I had suspected. Maybe it wasn't as hard as I thought. I went back to my security station and reviewed the footage. I looked, and it was just me running away from nothing. The cameras didn't pick up anything. Just a crazy security guard running from thin air down the stairs and through the grass to the car. I sat there shocked. Was I tired? Hallucinating? I didn't know. All that I knew was that I was done with this place. In the morning, when my relief came, I looked at him straight in the eye and said, You're right. 
There is something about this place, and I'm not coming back to find out. Good luck. I told my company that I didn't want to be stationed there anymore, and within a few days, I was stationed at a nice, unhaunted building in the middle of the city, with great Wi-Fi. That's where I stayed for a few more years. But the thought in the back of my mind always did remain. Was that place seriously haunted? Or was it all in my mind? Maybe I'll never know. And maybe that's for the better. So my wife and I backpack slash hike a lot. The more remote the place, the better. In 2015, my wife and I were in the Bitterroot Wilderness in Montana. We had been out for two weeks on a 100 mile route, finding trails we kind of connected together on a few topo maps to make a loop. We had only seen one other person, Tom. We met him on our second day in and his last day out. He told us that he hadn't seen or ran into anyone out there. So as far as we all knew, we were going to be alone out there. He told us hunting season was weeks away, but there might be scouts out. To be very careful with our food, where we eat and are sent, because it's bear country. And he had seen a few and even one with cubs. He also mentioned that he had heard cougars in the distance, but that we should be okay as long as we stick together. We camped together that night, and the next morning we thanked him for his company, all the information he had given us, and parted ways. For two weeks, we hiked, saw some cool vistas, swam, saw and heard wildlife, and all the stuff you'd expect to see in the backcountry. We didn't really think about Tom again after a few days out, and hadn't seen anyone. We took the thought of being alone for granted, and let our guard down. As far as other people were concerned, we were all alone out there. We were in our last few days out, winding the trip down, sauntering back to the trailhead, and just taking it all in. We found a nice flat tent site, made a fire, cooked some dinner, and hung our food bag and walked back to our tent for the night, and passed a good night's sleep. The next morning, as backpackers do, we break camp as early as possible, get some breakfast and coffee into us, but before we leave camp, I really needed to drop a deuce. So I venture away from the tent site to find a suitable spot. As I'm walking around, I find a place to dig my cat hole. I come up on a lumped up thing looking like a bush. I was not expecting to run into anyone out there, as we had only seen one other person early on, and no one else since. I wasn't paying attention. I was looking for somewhere to go and not looking out for people. These two are in camo slash blind type of rap, and I didn't realize they were there. They didn't hear or realized that I walked up on them till the last damn minute when I was right on top of them tripping over one of their legs. They scared the crap out of me, and I scared the crap out of them. When I hit the guy's leg, I startled him, he kind of jumped up, knocking their blind off for the big reveal. The guy that was on his knees had a penis in his hand, apparently blowing the other guy that is up against the tree. He's looking at me with a look of, WTF, who are you? And I'm caught. My sight is going back and forth from hunter, penis, hunter, hunter, penis. And the guy standing yells at me, what are you doing, man? They scramble, trying to stand up, the other one pulling his pants up, all while both fighting the blind that's wrapped in between them. Me, in disbelief on what just came up, just stood there for what felt like forever. 
I stumbled over my words to find an apology and blurt out, Nothing, guys. Sorry. Uh, have fun. And turned back to my camp and almost ran. They yelled out to me to stop, but I didn't. It was the longest 200 yard sprint ever. I got back to my camp and my wife looked at me and instantly knew something had happened. She asked what was up. I told her to grab her stuff and we hurried out of there without a word. After about an hour of sprinting and hiking, we had to stop. I still hadn't taken a dump and I really had to go. So we took a spur trail to break, snack and tell her what happened. She told me she was worried and that I had scared her. She was scared the whole time thinking I'd been chased by a bear or cougar or something and that it was after us. I told her it was nothing like that, that it was just two hunters hiding out blowing each other. We talked a bit about it and she asked if I thought they were looking for us. I told her that they yelled at me, wanting to know what the hell I was doing, if we should just make it back to the car and leave. No, let's just wait them out, just in case they're at the trailhead waiting. Like I said, we'd been out for about two weeks now, and we have been making our way back, and a less than a day's hike from the trailhead at this point. So they must have gone out after being caught, right? After a while of talking it over, we kind of just chuckled it off and hiked on to the creek where we were going to camp for the next night. We made camp off trail in a nice outcrop with no incident. Next morning, we break camp, do our morning routine and hike out to the trailhead. With that, we're not really thinking of the two hunters anymore. Well, as we get to the trailhead, we meet two ladies that had been prepping breakfast and now cleaning up. As we were walking to the parking lot, they chat up with the usual backcountry questions. How long have we been out there? How many miles did we do? Did we see any bears? What did we eat? Then amongst all the same, one lady offered up some food they had left over. As the other gal starts yelling, Hey hubby, these two have been hiking up the same trail you and so and so were just out the other day on. But they were out for two weeks. Bring them some of that real food and juice. The hubby pokes his head out of their camper to say hi. Lo and behold, it was the hunter that was against the tree. His smile faded as quick as his face turned white and then to an angry look when he realized who he was looking at. Then his body, the giver, turns the damn corner from the trailer to see me standing there. I feel the blood just drain from my body and this guy's face turns from happy-go-lucky to disbelief and fear at the sight of me. The wife then asked if we happened on their husbands out there as they were scouting for game yesterday. As I'm stumbling my words, they are darting to looks from me to themselves. Before I can say anything, my wife is answering, Yes, we'd love some real food. No, we haven't seen anyone. You guys are the first we've seen in two weeks. The wife turns to the hunters and say, You guys must have had real good hiding spots. I think both the hunters and me had a mini heart attack. One of the guys just gives a nod. My wife and I graciously take their pancakes and sausage. I can see both hunters quietly talking to each other, staring over at me every once in a while. I do my best to avoid the situation by picking up the car, while my wife is thanking the hunters wives for the food. Both hunters with sidearms on their hips. They come up to me with a beer. The one that was on the tree kind of pushed it into my chest, asking if I'd seen anything out there. My heart freaking stopped. I again stumbled over my words. Other than some wild animals, nothing worth writing home about. Yeah, we didn't see much either. But we're really surprised you didn't hear us last night walk through your camp. Be careful. You never know what can happen out there in the middle of the woods. After a few seconds, the other one just smirks and they turn to leave. Have a safe trip home. I wasn't sure what was going to happen in that moment. 
so I was readying myself for a fight. I was kind of shaken up as we were leaving the trailhead, and my wife asks if I was okay, and if they were the guys I'd seen. My reply was, yeah, what do you think, babe? And then asked what they said to me. I told her I thought I was going to have to fight them, but they just aggressively gave me a beer to buy my silence. I didn't mention the passive aggressive threat that they made about walking through our camp. I guess hunters can really be dicks sometimes. I had a rather strange night a few years back, in 2013 roughly. Back then, I was visiting my uncle's house in a pretty low population area of northern Colorado that was founded in the early 1800s. There's a lot of dirt roads and a super old cemetery with graves from that century as well. We would go out there with the intention of ghost hunting in the cemetery and also finding new spots to explore, including a house where we've encountered a spirit telling us to audibly get out. Right before we saw red eyes appear, about six feet high in the doorway. Not being scared off, we continued to explore different spots, going up there almost every weekend for a few months. There were several strange events that we experienced, but definitely the strangest by far occurred one night, while driving out there with my uncle and three of my cousins. The first part of the story happened at around 2am on a dirt road, about a 15 minute drive away from any form of civilization. So we're driving down the road and come to a bridge where there's a pretty fast flowing river going underneath. So we decide it's a good spot to stop and check it out. Next to the bridge and river, there's a large grain field stretching way out to a small forest maybe a half mile away into the distance. You're able to walk into the field by way of a dirt path heading towards the forest. After walking around for a few minutes, watching the water and not really having anything happen, we're getting ready to go and we see a small orange light appear in the middle of the grain, starting to slowly bob up and down, slowly coming towards us. Keep in mind that we're out in the middle of nowhere, and there's no homes or any form of civilization nearby for a few miles. So we see this light, and get a little nervous, thinking maybe it's like a person out there who owned the land or something, and were coming to tell us to leave. So we get back in the car, and start to slowly drive away while watching the light. This strange thing about the light is it was square, almost looking like a lantern, and it seemed to come out of nowhere. So as we're slowly rolling away, the light starts to pick up speed towards us. I'm talking about at least 10 miles an hour fast, just moving through the grain field. So we're officially spooked at this point, and we start to drive faster away and about a quarter of a mile down the road, my uncle's van just dies. All electronics go out and the engine shuts off and we're just slowly rolling surrounded by silence, still able to see the light in the field, not slowly moving. So my uncle luckily gets the van started back up and we fly out of there. Fast forward a week, we go back up there to the exact same spot to check it out during the day. And we get to the bridge and make a startling discovery. Under the bridge, where only a week ago, there was a fast river flowing. It just dried up and was a narrow pathway where you could tell a river once was. The thing is, it looked like it had been dried up for years. After being confused for a minute, we decided that there was something strange afoot about this area and that we should come back later at night to see what happened. So we go about our day and wait for it to get dark. 
at 1am, we headed back over to the spot, and the whole vibe everywhere was just super weird. So we pull up and shut off the van, and it takes us all about a second to muster up the strength to leave the car. One of my cousins and I decided to start to walk up the dirt path that leads alongside the grain fields towards the forest, pretty close to where we saw the lights that week before. We're just walking along, kind of bullshitting, trying to talk to each other and distract ourselves to not be nervous. We're walking along, and it's pretty quiet. There's nothing happening. And as I'm starting to pull my phone out, to have it ready to record in case anything happened, we heard my uncle start yelling for us in a hurry, and to come back in a super concerned voice. So we turn around and we're maybe a little over of a quarter of a mile away from the car, and we start back, not in a hurry or anything, and maybe five seconds goes by, and there's a loud sound that goes off towards the forest. I always have trouble explaining exactly how it happened, but it was just this deep roaring sound, almost exactly like the one you'd hear in COD Black Ops Zombies when you turn on the power in the theater, just like no normal animal or human sound I've ever heard before. Anyway, we heard the sound and take off running back at full speed towards the car. I covered that distance in less than 30 seconds, and I was back in the car with the door locked faster than I ever thought possible. After my cousin and I calmed down after a few minutes, we all get out of the car and tell my uncle and other cousin what we heard. He then told us the reason he called us to come back to the car in the first place was because he saw three lights shoot up in the sky right above our heads, and it freaked him out. After being shaken up, we decided to leave. As we're driving back home, we're all just talking about how weird the vibe was all night. And just as my uncle was saying something, we start to pass by something on the side road. And we're all like, what the hell is that? So we turned around and pulled over to get it out. There's just a car on the side of the dirt road, just flipped on its back with the window shattered. A fresh sign of an accident. We were checking if anyone was hurt, but no one was around. Again, we were miles into the middle of nowhere, and there was nowhere for anyone to go. Whoever crashed also left their purse behind, which we thought was strange. We checked the surrounding areas. No one was around to be found. So we called the cops and let them know about the accident and headed home. Some weird stuff happened while I was trying to sleep throughout the night. Like through the window, I could see the lights outside keep turning on and off, and I was laying in the dark by myself in the living room. I didn't sleep until the sun got up. After doing some reflection, I wasn't sure what to make of the whole situation, and just figured it could be something like a spirit or a skinwalker or a Bigfoot or something. And it was maybe just a coincidence with the car accident, but I'm not sure. Now, I've kind of pieced together that it could be something like an alien encounter. Like the lights in the sky that my uncle saw, the weird inhuman scream, and the car could have been like an abduction site, where they bring the person back after some time and make them wake up thinking they were just in an accident only because it was just so sketchy how the car was perfectly intact, other than the windows being shattered, and the obvious fact that it was completely flipped over, and there was no second car or dented parts, like if a second car had flipped it over, and it was all flat land, so I couldn't make sense of the car. It couldn't have just flipped over by itself, and not be all destroyed or scratched or dented. It literally looked like someone picked it up, set it perfectly on the roof, and just smashed out the windows. But that's my weird story, and I strongly feel like it had some sort of extraterrestrial encounter. This happened a long time ago. I'd say this happened when I was around 8, 11 years ago in fact. 
My family and I were on holiday in Spain, in a city quite close to Barcelona. We went to a very big and luxurious resort with a ton of sports fields, from basketball to soccer. It took up a lot of space, and it had really tall fences around the perimeter to make sure no one could get in at night. To give you some perspective, I think they had eight soccer fields, four basketball courts, two rugby pitches, and probably some other stuff too. During the day, all of the fields were full of people playing sports, and it was always a ton of fun there. But at night, the perimeter closes. I stayed late with a friend. I don't remember his name, so we'll call him Brian. Brian and I didn't want to go home yet, so we stayed a bit longer to shoot penalties on the soccer field. Eventually, they closed the fence. But since we were too far away from them to see us, and vice versa, we only found out that the fence was closed when we tried to leave. This was already scary. It was a huge, unlit place in a foreign country, surrounded by big fences. After freaking out for a little, we decided we didn't want to get into trouble, so we set out to follow the fence to look for holes through which we could escape instead of calling for help. After a solid 20 minutes, we find a hole. But it's not connected to the resort, but to a dark forest. We figured it wasn't a large forest, and that it would be safe given that it was right next to the resort. We go through the hole, and begin crossing the forest. A mere five minutes later, we enter a large, bare spot, with an old, damaged, graffitied concrete shed. We avoided it, as best we could. But soon we heard some glass bottles moving around in the shed. Out walks this old man. He stares at us for ten seconds. We are paralysed by fear. He looks deranged. Like someone who had been homeless for the larger part of his life. His clothes were ripped, hair and beard very long and disgusting. He even had a limp. He coughs, which wakes up another man in the shed. This looks exactly like Charles Patashik from Breaking Bad. They start to slowly walk in our direction, speaking to us in Spanish. We slowly back up. They see this, and they charge. They start running, screaming, and throwing stuff at us. We are running for our lives. The forest is pitch black. We can barely see ahead of us, let alone see if there's an end to this seemingly infinite forest. After about ten minutes of running, we reach the edge of the forest. We were on a small town road next to a huge cliff. There were no houses, no people, and we were still being chased. We follow the road uphill, finally gaining some ground on the homeless psychopaths. The road ends. The only thing we see is a mansion without any burning lights. We figure it's all or nothing, and we climb their gate and hide in their backyard. The homeless men follow us, but by the time they managed to get in, we were already hidden in some dense, dark bushes. They made quite a bit of noise, which woke up the residents. Out comes a man screaming and looking around his garden. He closely passes by us, but did not see us. He was holding a gun. I didn't get a close look. But I think it was a shotgun, an older one that holds two shells. He inevitably spots the homeless men, and fired a warning shot into the air. The Charles Patashik looking man charges at him, but gets knocked down. He forces the homeless men out of his garden at gunpoint. We fought safe for a second, until we realised we were in a shotgun wielding man's garden. 
and that we did not know where the homeless men were. We wait a bit to be sure that the man is asleep, and that the homeless men have left. When we leave, around a half hour later, the men are gone, and the roads are quiet. We follow the same road, but now downhill, and run into a small town. We still have no idea where we are. It has been three hours since we left the resort, and we finally realized what just happened and freaked out. After walking for another 10 to 15 minutes, we see a house with people in the living room. We ring the bell and try to ask the way. Most Spanish people don't speak Dutch, and we didn't really speak English all that well. We told her the name of the resort, and she points downhill. This seems like a fairly standard road. We stick closely to the houses and follow the road. I didn't know this at this point, but apparently there was an abandoned slaughterhouse close to the entrance of the resort. We heard Dutch voices from somewhere around the building, so we go in asking directions. Enter a bloody hellhole. Everywhere, there's blood. On the floor, on the walls, on the equipment, and even the ceiling. Bloody knives everywhere. It wasn't a very nice experience. The other people run into us as we ask directions. It's a two minute walk away. When we finally hit the resort, the staff don't let us in because they don't know if we're residents of the resort. They make us tell them the house of our parents to come and get us. There were still pancakes left when I got back, and I played Pokemon with my brother. My mum gave me 10 euros for the arcade the next day, which was when my bike got stolen. I am very close with my boyfriend's seven-year-old son, and last Saturday, I took him out to one of our local parks to go sledding. There is a dedicated sled hill, and there are tons of families that use it in the winter, which is actually a wide dam that goes across the park by the lake. I should explain there is also a bike slash walking path around the entire perimeter of the park that actually goes around the top of the dam and leads to either a main road sidewalk or curves back down to continue the path at the bottom of the other side of the hill. We got there just between 3 p.m and had a blast all afternoon, sledding and venturing out on the frozen lake. It was a fairly busy day at the park, but around 5.30, it starts to get dark. So the temperature was dropping and people started to go home for dinner. None of these things phased my little man because less people meant free reign of the hill to claim better sledding territory. While we were playing, I noticed a man walking along the path at the top of the hill, but didn't think much of it because there was still one group sledding. I did watch him though, because I thought it was a little odd to be taking a walk in the dark alone with no dog or anything. When it's pretty cold, and I also felt he probably wasn't a park employee doing a safety round because it wasn't late enough for them to be out, and they usually are in warm vehicles. So a little weird, but he just walked the path with his head down, and when I saw him pass totally, I let us continue sledding. When I got us to the top of the hill, I looked to the bottom of the other side, and saw him walking along the path there. I brushed the weird vibe off to me just being paranoid, about serial killers and people who take people and the like. I genuinely did not even notice the other group leave because of how engrossed we were in our little racing competitions. I also didn't have my phone out, much because I didn't want the cold to drain the battery faster. But going to where I was from when I made the call to my boyfriend, I think I saw the guy again around 6.30. I was at the bottom yelling taunts up to the kid that he couldn't surpass the distance I had gone when I saw the man walking again, 
right in my boyfriend's son direction. The height, coat color, and demeanor of this guy were all the same, but other than that, I couldn't be 100% sure it was the same person. I looked down and realized how dark it was, how far away my car in the parking lot was, and how very much alone we were. The only other people near to us were maybe three people still out in their ice fishing huts about a half mile away on the lake. I yelled, hurry up, as playfully as I could. The kid slid it down and the guy was passing by the same way he did before. At that point, I was very uneasy and told my little buddy it was probably time to go. He insisted I go up one more time to see if I could beat his distance. This kid had been waiting forever for this sledding day and was having so much fun. So I quickly got up the hill and got ready to sled down. The guy was to my left now, a good distance away and looked like he was just going to walk the same path. I started to sled down while keeping my head turned towards him. He was almost at the main sidewalk when all of a sudden, I watched him turn his head diagonally down the hill towards us, fast. He was making a beeline for right where we were. I was scared shitless. I hit the bottom of the hill, stood up, and ran over towards the direction of the parking lot in front of us. My boyfriend's son was half focused on the fact that I didn't let him sled down or ride the full distance, and half focused on finding his water bottle before we left which was somewhere on the ground in the snow. I didn't want to scare him, but I said, leave it, we need to leave, just leave it. The guy was approaching, heading down, and one hand in his coat pocket, as we were flat out retreating. It didn't feel dangerous enough to break out into a run. Plus my car was at the back of the lot, and the ground was quite slick. Or to call 911, but I got scared enough that I felt a rush of adrenaline and shoved the kid, still complaining about the bottle, behind me. Pulled out my phone and called my boyfriend, who I prayed had gotten off work, because I didn't even comprehend the time until later, about 6.45. He answered and I loudly said, Hey bud, dad's on the phone. Yeah, we're leaving the park. What would you like me to pick up for dinner? I was very afraid this guy was going to pull out a gun or a knife and try to make us go somewhere else. And I knew a phone call probably wouldn't intimidate someone who really wants to hurt you. But it was what my hyped up scared self decided to do. I went on to ask my boyfriend what time he got off work, even though I knew full well exactly when he got off and other questions that may tip him off that something was going on. He just answered them as if I were an idiot. And as he talked to me, the guy passed us very closely. He was tall and had a hood on, but I could see his face and glasses. There was so much free open space around us, and he walked so close to me that his coat nearly brushed me, and the fog from my breath touched him. He kept his hands in his pocket the whole time. I am 24 years old and five foot one, and didn't even have my pepper spray on me because my purse was in my car. Thankfully, he just kept going, did not look back, and disappeared behind a truck in the parking lot. Very quietly, I whispered to my boyfriend, who was getting annoyed with the random lines of conversation. Will you just stay on the phone with me? He paused for a minute and asked, are you scared? What's going on? I quickly explained it and pulled my protesting kid along to my car where I shoved him in, shoved the sleds in and got the hell out of there. I think there's something in your brain that makes you want to believe a bad situation isn't happening. I kept trying to minimize everything as it was happening, probably to keep myself from panicking. Now, I just keep thinking about how creepy it was that he came back after everyone had left and seemingly made a decision to turn back around and rush down the hill towards a woman and a child who were all alone in a dark park. Even if he didn't have bad intentions at all, 
I'm sure he could tell I was scared by the way I reacted to everything he did. He was either a creep or really lacked awareness in what he was doing. From now on, we go home when we see the last few people go home, and it starts to get dark. I am a 24-year-old female that moved from Orlando, Florida to 18 miles outside of Valdosta, Georgia. Basically, the middle of nowhere. It was to my family's farm. I never had any issues in Orlando, but I got divorced and had to move in with my mother. It was my two small boys and I. Anyway, we moved into one of the old farmhouses on my family's farm, and it needed a lot of work. It was eight bedrooms and a mother-in-law suite. When we moved in, we only had two rooms cleaned up and worked on the rest of the house over the course of the nine months. The man across the street, Jay, was very helpful. From day one, he would come over almost every day as he was feeding up his animals and help with anything I needed. Over the course of nine months, I never had any issues and thought he was just a friendly middle-aged man. I never felt he had any ill intentions. The farmhouse was in a U-shape. The room I chose had windows in the courtyard area. This was the middle of the house. Jay had fenced in that area when I first moved in, so that I could let the boys play. The farmhouse was in the middle of the farm and set off the road so I never had any worries of being watched, mostly as my bedroom windows are in the fenced in area in the middle of the house. So I didn't put curtains on my bedroom or bathroom. One day, my son was playing under the carport and Jay pulled up in his truck. He was going to look at my car for me. Jay didn't make it to the carport before my eldest son says to me, Hey, I saw him in my window last night. Later that night, I talked to my son, and he told me he did see him out a window. I asked him if it was the kitchen window, because you can see his horse pastures, and he stops to feed them every morning and night. Chalking it up to that, I didn't think much else about it. But other things had happened. I guess you could say, I wanted him to be the person I thought he was, so I overlooked a lot. My favourite candy somehow appeared in my fridge one day after school. My mum told me she remembered me telling Jay it was my favourite. And someone sent me flowers every Friday for a couple of months. I thought it was my ex-husband, or possibly my boyfriend at the time, but neither man would admit to it. My boyfriend jokingly told me it was Jay. The next day I came home from school and my mum had the boys playing under the carport, and Jay was working on my car. My air suspension had a leak, and Jay offered to look at it before I took it all the way to Tallahassee for the expensive repair. I got out of my mother's car, and he asked me if he wanted to see the leak I had found. As I bent over the hood, Jay stepped back. When I turned around, I commented jokingly, on his 90s era cell phone he had in his hand. It's the type you don't see anymore, like a very early camera flip phone. Later that night, we came inside, and my mum told me she could swear that Jay had taken a picture of me on his phone. I know it sounds crazy, but I didn't believe her. This man was seriously always friendly, never any weird vibes from him. If I offered to pay him, it was always at cost, and that was rare, as he would not accept my money. I should have known that people just aren't like that these days. I guess I was very naive. A couple of weeks later, I was mowing my courtyard. It was growing up pretty bad, and as I got close to my window, my heart 
literally sank to my butt. I had a newly placed center block outside both windows and my bathroom window. I can't tell you how, but I knew at that point I had made a huge mistake and everyone was right about Jay. I called my friend and neighbor Josh to come look at the center blocks. He ran home and got a deer cam, attaching it to a tree outside my window. This was at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. That night I came home around six and was unloading the boys when I turn around and Jay was standing right behind me. He said that he didn't mean to scare me and he heard from my mother that I was out of town. I said, yes, sir. I knew he knew because they are friends on Facebook. He told me to call him if I got scared or needed anything. I got the boys inside and we got snuggled into bed. They fell asleep in my bed when I realized that I had missed Sunday's Game of Thrones episode. It was a really good one. So I went to my mother's bed to watch. I was laying there talking to my ex-husband about the boys and the show when Josh called. I clicked over and he asked me if my boyfriend was over. I told him no, that it was 9.02 p.m. And he told me that a man is outside my window. The deer cam snapped the first picture at 9.02. My boys are in my room sleeping. Josh told me not to worry. He was already coming up the driveway and to meet him outside the other side of the house. Fear and dread literally drained through me. I slowly walked into the other room and calmly scooped up my boys. I shut the door and sprinted through the house as fast as I could. We sat in Josh's truck until the police arrived. The deer cam snapped photos at 9.02, 9.22 and 9.30. He stood outside my window that long waiting for me to come back. The police walked back into the field and could see where he was parking, but he had already gone. Behind the house is a massive produce field and it was a tractor road for tractor access. I showed them the photos and ID'd Jay. He was arrested at 2am that morning, and when they went through his phone, there were nine months worth of pictures. Pictures of me mowing, pictures of me playing with my kids, pictures of me in my bathroom, sleeping, bending over the hood of my car. He was watching me the entire time. I couldn't and didn't sleep for weeks. He ended up getting out of jail the following weekend and came into my mum's post office. She is a male lady to tell her that he found my dog dead and he buried it for me. And even after that, I only received five years probation and a restraining order. He still lives across the street. I stayed for maybe three months and then moved on to Fort Wharton Beach. I am a fly fisherman who spends every weekend out hiking remote rivers and streams in search of brown trout. I live in Montreal. My usual routine is to drive down to a river that starts in upstate New York, fish a couple of kilometers of the river where no one really lives or goes, then head across the border to head back down to the river on the Canadian side. So I'm out there one morning by myself. I had been out there over a hundred times, so it wasn't new territory by any means. That said, I was getting close to the area where other anglers had warned me about angry landowners and threats from dudes with shotguns, so I was pretty alert. I come down to the section of river and there's kind of a split, around a little island of 50 to 100 feet but it reconnects and the Hu River veers off to the left. Most days I stay left of the island. There are a few holes and this day I went right. So my view up the river was obscured until I came around a corner of the island. I get to the point, look up about 250 feet in front of me 
and standing there is this beige golden animal crossing the river. My first thought was it's someone's dog. Hmm, no, too remote of an area. I'm standing there looking at this thing crossing the river and things are racing through my head because what I'm looking at doesn't make sense to me from where I'm standing. This thing still hasn't seen me. It's just gingerly making its way through about one or two feet of water, trying to cross across at a determined walk. That's when I notice the tail. I know a lot of dogs, but I've never seen a tail like, and then the hair on the back of my neck goes up. I'm looking at a mountain lion in upstate New York, about a kilometer from the Canadian border. I step back behind a tree. I stood there for a few more seconds waiting for it to cross. When it got to the other side, there was no doubt in what I'd seen. I decided that I've gone far enough for the day and began making my way back to the truck, which with the way the river bends is pretty much in the same direction the cat was going. Oh dear. I get back to the truck, make my way home and contact the New York fishing game. I provide some data, and they say they'll look into it. Most buddies who I fish with out there think I'm nuts, obviously. And then my parents send me a clip from a local newspaper about a month later, confirming that it's been spotted. A couple of years later, I come across another article. So needless to say, I feel a little less crazy. My fellow anglers and I exercised a little more caution in that area, henceforth. You know, when I saw this cat, he didn't see me. The wind was in the right direction, so I doubt he smelled me, but I didn't even get a glance from him. So, while obviously rattled, I didn't fear for my life at that moment. A year or so later, the same river but about six to seven kilometers away, I was out fishing one evening. It was roughly 7 to 7.30 on a June evening. I was alone, and I could without a doubt hear something sneaking through the woods making its way towards me. I'd hear a branch crack and silence. Maybe a few steps. It was weird. It started off way off, and it just got closer and closer to me. I called out. If someone's out there, there's no need to sneak around. It was dead quiet. I fished a few more minutes, and this thing was just creeping closer and closer. It got about 30 feet from me, but I couldn't see into the bush. It was too dark. There was too much bush. I could feel the eyes. I backed out of the river, and the eyes never left the spot until I reached the far bank. And I walked about half a kilometer down the stream on the opposite side of the bank from the sounds to a different spot. I get down there. And within 30 minutes, whatever it was has followed me and was creeping up on me again. I was thinking that this wasn't funny anymore. I scream out into the silence. Hey dude, this isn't funny anymore. And I met with silence. Okay, enough of this. I backed out of the river and back up to my vehicle and got the hell out of there. I really felt like I was being stalked. And let me tell you, it was not a fun experience. The spot where I fish, two to three kilometers on both sides of the border, I've just seen some weird stuff. Everything from weird shady campsites that are way too close to the border that pop up overnight, to being stalked at dusk, escaped convicts, mountain lions, hunters, and angry landowners. Sometimes if you go down there and the wind is right, you can literally hear voices come from all around you. Now I know that that sounds insane, but I've been down there with half a dozen people and we've all heard it. The stuff I go through just to hook a few nice brown trout. When I was younger, I used to horseback around Northern California for weeks at a time. This was during the late seventies and early eighties. I rarely used a compass but I always had a map of my area. 
I'm pretty good at dead reckoning via landmarks. I've never been lost in my life, except once. I was in the Six Rivers National Forest, heading south towards Trinity County. This is very rough terrain. Lots of high ridges, steep hills, and rocks everywhere. A nasty brush to tangle you. I was riding the ridges, heading generally south, and trying to find easy places to cross to the next ridge when it became convenient. The skies were partially cloudy, and it was a cool 60 Fahrenheit, cold for that time of year, since it was early August, and the temperatures usually lingered around 90 Fahrenheit plus during the day. I found a reasonable spot to cross over the next ridge, south of me, and started down. When I got into the ravine, it turned out that what looked easy from above was actually a rocky nightmare. I started walking up the ravine to find an easier place to get out of there. A wind picked up, and it started drizzling. I walked for a mile or so, and couldn't find anything that I wanted to risk my neck on, or more importantly, my horse's hooves, and decided to start up the side I had come down originally. I got to the top, took a look around to orient myself, and froze in shock. The landscape was completely different. I don't mean that it was lower or easier or less rocky. I mean that all of my landmarks were gone. Some of them were peaks that were 30 to 40 miles away. Others were a lot closer. It was completely different. I had no idea where I was, and I was completely disoriented. I dug up my map and started to review where I was, the angles on the hills I had been navigating earlier. I couldn't find anything that matched. The only thing that I could possibly identify with the route up from the ravine that I had just come up. Since it was cloudy, I couldn't navigate by the sun. All I had were the landmarks that I used for dead reckoning, and those were gone. The wind was picking up, and it was getting very cold. I almost expected snow. I had no idea where I was, so I decided to backtrack to my last known position and see if I could pick up where I left off. I started down the hill, got to the bottom of the ravine, and started the opposite direction up. This time I was very careful, watching for signs of my passage before, and the hill I came down in the first place. It stopped raining, the wind died down, and the day started to warm up. I found my original trail down the hill, started back up, and I got to the top. All the landmarks were there now. I was totally confused. I kept going on the ridge, watching carefully to find where I had come up before. When I got to the spot where I thought it should be, there was no sign of it. I cast back and forth for a while, trying to find my trail with no success. All of my landmarks were there to see. Eventually I gave up, and continued on the ridge. A bit later, I found an easy trail down and an easy trail back up to the other side, and continued on my way. To this day, I still have no idea what happened. Even though it was drizzling, I should have been able to see those landmarks closer. And honestly, the further landmarks were big enough to see. To that point, thinking back on it, there was no sign that it was drizzling when I continued to where I had ascended the first time and the temperature swings were wild that day. Easily 30 to 40 Fahrenheit. It's not uncommon in the mountains, but really odd for that time of year in the first place. Another thing. Originally I had chosen to descend at that point, because there was nothing to prevent me from going up on the other side. I could see easily from the ridge top, but when I arrived, there were tons of boulders blocking me that I should have been able to see from the top. Eerie and creepy at the time, for sure. 
but I was more focused on trying to orient myself, but thinking back on it now, even more so. One of the scariest things that has ever happened to me was when I was hiking slash climbing a mountain in the Adriandax that I was unfamiliar with. My two friends were in much better shape at the time, and we ended up separated. They had been moving faster than I was, and went on ahead. However, I came to a fork in the trail, and had to guess which way to go. So I went left. Another mile or two later, another fork. That time, I went right. Miles kept going by, and the realization that I'm completely alone in a forest that I know very little about had hit me. I hadn't seen the map, and was planning on relying on my friends. I'm thinking in my mind, maybe I should have gone right at the first fork, or maybe I should have gone right at the second fork. Where could they have been? I kept walking, listening for other hikers, road noises, anything really. I hear nothing but the sound of the forest. My water pack runs out. Dehydration begins to set in. My leg muscles started cramping along with my shoulders, and within about an hour my head is pounding. My hands are shaky, and I start to worry more. I keep walking, one foot in front of the other for hours. The sun is beginning to set. I don't know if I'm heading towards a road or civilization, or if I'm heading deeper into the forest. I keep going. My legs are so heavy. My head hurts so much, I'm so thirsty, anxiety level is too high to think clearly. When I stop to rest, I only feel more tired, and it's harder to get my legs back started again. I stop to pee, and it's the darkest pee I've ever seen in my life. Just as the sun is about to set, I walk down onto a fire road. At first I'm excited, but then I realize I don't know if I should turn left or right. One way might take me further away from where I want to be. I turn right, and start walking. The sun is setting, and the forest is so dense, it turns quickly dark. I keep walking. I have thoughts of thinking that I should give up. And I think, what does giving up look like? Will I just lay down on this fire road and go to sleep? Or lay down and die? Just having a conversation with myself as I go, I see a creek on the other side of the road. I stop, and feel compelled to drink from it. It's moving water, slowly moving water, and I'm afraid that it might make me sick. Is it worth the risk? What if it makes me vomit, and I end up in even worse shape? I keep walking, moving slowly. So slowly. My feet are hurting, thighs are chafed raw, and sting so badly. My running shoes have worn through the skin on the back of my Achilles tendon. Blood has been seeping through my socks and into my shoes. I hear a noise, I walk a little faster, until I see a bed and breakfast. I walk right up to their front doors, as if I own the place, and plan to use their restroom and guzzle water for the sink. Perfect plan. Excuse me, could you take a picture of us? A very attractive woman approaches me with an expensive looking DSLR camera in her outstretched hand. I don't answer, but found the camera already in my hand, as she was five steps away walking to her husband and two children who were already posing in front of me. I'm so confused. I snap away, smile awkwardly, and she takes the camera out of my hand and says thank you, with a huge smile on her face. I wander inside and walk into the bathroom. I look in the mirror, 
and I've never looked so bad in my life. Pale and pasty skin. My lips were far too bright to be normal. Dirt on my face. All clothes soaked through with sweat. I lean my face into the sink and drink water until I could not drink any more. I sat down on the front steps of this grand B&B and waited. I was glad I made it, but didn't know where I was and did not have my cell phone. Not that there was service there anyway. But about an hour later, there come my two friends walking down the same dirt road. We met up, walked to their car, and stopped at a diner to eat. I drank nearly a dozen glasses of water. This is an encounter I had about eight months ago. I was out for a drive this evening through some back roads outside my small urban town around 10.30 to 11 p.m. I've driven these roads dozens of times before and I've never had an issue until tonight. Just a preface. There are little to no houses along these specific roads, and there's never traffic, so it's very isolated. I'm cruising around the twisty roads, enjoying myself, and kind of in my zone, when I come over the crest of a right turn that goes up a hill, which then sweeps down into a flat left turn, which has a guardrail along the right side of the road. As I crest the hill, as I was going fairly slow, 40 to 50, as there are often deer or possums in the area, I notice a moving figure along the guardrail. I begin to slow some more, as I figure it's a deer and don't want to hit it. But as I get closer, I realize it's not a deer. It looks like a man. At this point, I'm barely moving, just creeping forwards to get closer to it. And I realize it's a man who's crouched down in a sort of slav squat. And he's now turned around to look at me. In my headlights, the first things I notice are, he's not wearing any clothes, save for a pair of tidy whities or an adult diaper. His eyes are oddly large for an adult man, and completely brown or black, and his skin was ghostly white. As I approached, I turned my brights on, and he didn't even flinch. By now, I've completely stopped, and started to reach down to get my phone, as I wanted to take a video. This was a huge mistake. I look away for a split second to grab my phone from the passenger seat, and as I'm starting to look down, he starts sprinting at me. He is running directly towards me. Shit. He gets up to my window and starts screaming, not just like a man yelling, but like all the rage he's ever felt is coming out at this moment, and it's directed at me. He starts pounding on the window with his fists, all the while screaming his head off. This lasts for about three seconds before I throw it into first gear and peer loud, though it felt like a whole minute. As I'm accelerating, first gear in my car takes me to roughly about 40. I look in my rearview mirror and realize he's keeping up with me. It's not until I get it into second, then third, and take it up to 80, that I can see him no longer. He was running at inhuman speeds, trying to keep up. I flew the rest of the way home, afraid to stop or look into my mirrors. I got in the driveway, ran inside, and typed this up. I have no idea what I encountered, but I did, and I hated every second of it. I'd be finding other routes to take when I take nighttime drives in future, just so that I don't ever 
meet him again. I was driving on the back roads, on the edge of the city limits. It was dark, there was no lighting at all. A few rest stops here and there, and I was meeting a woman off Craigslist, and already feeling a wee bit nervous. I was driving pretty fast, with no other cars in sight, when out of nowhere, I see a guy running across the road. He was already almost right in front of my car. It looked like he was getting chased by another guy, who I didn't see until I swerved to avoid the first one, while braking hard. My car went kind of sideways, and hit the second guy pretty fierce. Not at full speed though, and I heard a loud thud, but didn't actually see him get hit. My car ended up on the side of the road. The first guy seems to have kept running out of sight, as he wasn't there when I got out. This was a red flag, but I had just hit someone and was worried that I had off them. I was all shaky and had that sinking feeling in my stomach. I ran towards a guy who was on the floor breathing heavily. Thank goodness he was alive. I asked if he was okay. He didn't respond. He just kept breathing really hard. Then I took out my phone to call 911. Just as I was typing in the number, that's when I heard him say, No, don't call anyone. Don't call the cops. He said it pretty alarmed. So I just looked over at him with my phone in hand, flash on, and I asked him if he could stand. He got up slowly with a slight limp, with my light shining on him. I could see his clothes were all tattered, and he was wearing two layers of clothes with a jacket, now torn at the arms. He had blood on his arms from where I guess he landed on the ground. He said, I'm fine. Do you have any cigarettes? Yeah, yeah, sure man. Let me go get them. I had a pack in my glove box since forever. I was an occasional smoker and only smoked with my co-worker. Not in a while. We walked over to the car. I get the cigarettes, handed them to him, and I put my phone to charge. The car was still on. As I did, he asked for a lighter, and I said, hold on, let me look for it. While lighting his cigarette, that's when I asked him, who was the other guy? He said, someone stole my backpack from me while I was sleeping. Oh, okay. He was definitely homeless then. I felt so bad. I started pulling out my wallet. I wanted to give him all the money in my wallet out of guilt. He looked fine now, albeit the bloody scraped arms, as his breathing had gotten normal. While pulling out my wallet and asking, you sure you don't want me to call an ambulance? That's when I felt the sharpest pain rock my face. I saw blurry for a couple of seconds. I started stumbling, and my body felt like it was about to fall over. Dizzy. When I came to, I saw my car pulling away and driving off. He punched me and took off, and left me with a pretty bad headache. I stood there in shock for what seemed like an eternity. I reached for my phone out of instinct, then I remembered I left it charging. Shit. I reached under my jacket to check if my gun was still on me. I felt relieved as I felt the cold metal of my sick sewer. Okay, good. At least I'm not out here defenseless. I kept walking down the road, endlessly, hoping to find someone. I was pissed off and scared, and a good few miles later I see some lights. As I get closer, I see it's one of those public restrooms. Well, nothing else in sight. There might be a payphone though. Now what do I see next? I couldn't believe my eyes. There's a car that looks just like mine parked right out front. I take a peek. The guy that took my car is asleep. Looks like he cleaned his arm off. No jacket. That moron. He could have kept driving, but I'm glad he didn't. I take out my gun and try to open the door. It's locked. I try all the doors. Locked. I didn't want to wake him up by banging on the car because I was afraid he was going to drive off. I looked over all the ground, 
and there was nothing to break the window. So I holster my gun, take off my jacket, and wrap it around my hand. I smash through it, glass spilling everywhere, and the guy jerks awake and starts fumbling around. All the while, I drop the jacket and rapidly unholster my gun. I'm pointing my gun right at his head and he says, Please don't shoot me. Instead of saying sorry, he just says that shit. I tell him to get out and walk towards the wall with his back turned. So I back up as he complied. I tell him not to move and then ask him where my keys are. After I got my keys from him, I drove off with glass all over the inside of my car. I never called the cops because I had hit him earlier and then because I pulled a gun on him. I was scared and worried about the legality of it. Also, I had brought it from an arms list, but the seller never signed the bill of sale. Only I did. So I was sketched out about that as well. Last thing I need is them checking my gun after he tells them about it and finding out the guy who sold it to me reported it as stolen. I probably would have been fine calling them, but I was tripping and never met the Craigslist chick. I went home. I was with a group of seven to eight guys who rented a cabin for the weekend for a bachelor party. The same group of guys get a cabin once a year for a bro weekend. We had hoped to get the same spot we normally book, but it was unavailable. So the best man ended up booking a place that we'd never been to before, in a very remote part of the state. The place itself was cool, built in 1780 or 1790 on a big creek and very remote. Now I'm a skeptic. But the guy who was getting married is not, and has had several experiences that has made him a believer. As soon as we walk in, the groom-to-be, Tom, says, This place is haunted. I can feel it. I don't buy it. Thinking that he's just saying it because the place was old. It was fascinating to think about the history there, though. It was in the middle of nowhere now. The people who lived there 200 years ago would have been completely removed from civilization. The first night, we all stayed up late partying into the morning. Tom, who was an offensive lineman in college, wakes me up by jumping on my bed and squashing me. We were supposed to go out that night to a nearby college town, but just ended up staying there. I was a little bored doing the same thing two nights in a row, and still tired from raging last night. So I ended up going to bed before anyone else at around midnight. I've of course heard about sleep paralysis, but never experienced it before. So I was terrified when I woke up for seemingly no reason and couldn't move at all. Almost immediately, I see a shadow in the doorway. I think that it's Tom and the best man who are trying to wake me up so I can rejoin the party. The shadow starts to move towards me. I think it's Tom, and that he's going to jump on the bed to squash me again. I try to yell out for him not to do that, but there's something wrong. I can't move, and I can't make a sound. Suddenly I realise that it's not Tom approaching my bed, but what I can only describe as a black shadowy mass. It did not have a human shape but was about the same height and width as a human. It's moving fast, and when it gets to the edge of my bed, it jumps like it's going to land on me and squash me, like I was worried that my friend was gonna do. When it gets over to me, it dissipates, spreads out, and vanishes in an instant. I can move again. I sit up and wonder what the hell just happened. I call out to my friends and there is silence. I look out the window and see that they are all outside there, still partying around the campfire. I get up, drink some water, and peek at my phone. It's 2am. I look in the others' rooms 
and they are indeed outside. It was maybe 10 seconds from the time I woke up, unable to move, to the time when the shadow or black mass disappeared. I was a little shaken up. Felt some adrenaline for sure, but wrote it off as a bad dream, and fell back asleep after 15 minutes or so. But when I awoke again, I immediately began to think about it. How weird it felt being unable to move, and what I saw. Months later, it's still on my mind, and that's why I decided to share this. My story freaked some of the bros out, but everyone loved this cabin so much more than the one we usually stayed at, that we're very likely to be going back there this fall. So perhaps I'll have more to share then, but I don't think I'd like to stay in that same room though. This story is from my cousin Steve. Steve is an outdoorsy person. He likes to camp and hike and stuff. He never gave me specifics on where he was with this story, so it could be anywhere in a forested area in the wilderness. He said it was late in September slash early October, something like that, and this was in 2004. He set up a little campsite in a small clearing no bigger than a large living room. The first night, everything was fine. No troubles at all. But that afternoon, quite a while after he'd woken back up, he felt oddly drawn to somewhere off in the distance in the forest. He said he was like on autopilot and wasn't fully aware of what he was doing. Steve said, he wasn't too far away from the campsite into the trees, when he noticed what looked like a toppled over grave. That's how he described it at least, a rectangular slab of stone. But he said it was weirdly out of place and definitely didn't belong there. It looked polished, sort of glossy and reflective. There was no writing or scrawling on it. It was smooth and plain, but despite it sitting on a pile of dead leaves, there was no forest debris on it, no twigs fallen, or even moss on it. It was very unusual, especially considering to his knowledge, there was nobody around for miles, but it looked like it had been placed there very recently. At the moment, Steve said that he felt as though he had been picked up and dropped randomly somewhere on earth and had zero clue where he was. He said, even though he could clearly make out the red canvas or nylon or whatever his tent may be 25 feet or so behind him, he said he was just utterly confused and totally unfamiliar with his surroundings. Then he said that two things happened very quickly. First, he felt an ice cold wave of air hit him, like a cold wind on a frigid winter day despite it being relatively warm for early autumn, and there was no wind present. The branches on the trees hadn't moved, and the leaves on the ground didn't budge at all. Second, he heard what sounded like a loud, deafening clap, like someone clapped their hands just once, really hard, and it echoed across the valley. Next thing he knew, the sun is already dipping below the horizon, and it's pretty dark in the woods. Only a split second earlier, it had been 3.30 in the afternoon. Now it was closer to 8 at night, in the blink of an eye. Steve said he did not see the stone on the ground anywhere, and he booked it to his tent, scared out of his mind. According to him, it wouldn't be a good idea to pack everything up right now at dusk and try to make his way back during the night so he'd have to wait until the morning to do so. He said he barely slept the entire night. All the while, he heard a seriously creepy sound not too far from the tent. He said it sounded like someone snoring, and it might have simply been a sleeping animal, like a bear or mountain lion. Not too sure if they snore, but they probably do. He waited a little bit until after dawn, and... He packed up his stuff and got out of there, with the feeling that he was being watched the entire time he was in the woods. 
While on a horse ride around the land of a friend's farm, we found what appeared to be the site of a death. The town we were just outside of had been the site of many a gold mine in the past. While out riding, we spotted a large hill and decided to appreciate the view from the top. Subsequently, we stumbled across an abandoned mine. The mine had various levels and pockets dotted around it, and we had fun exploring. This really is in the middle of nowhere, surrounded all around by natural bush and far from any thoroughfare. We wandered into an opening we were yet to explore and shortly came to the back of a shaft. To our left, a shaft opened and dropped well over 40 to 50 meters to the bottom of the mine. We could faintly make out the bottom in the low light. To our right was a small pit filled with stone fragments. Jumping into the pit, I was immediately struck by a strange feeling unlike anything I have yet to experience before or since. At this point, I should mention that the indigenous people of this area in Southern Africa believe in the power of witchcraft. I have seen firsthand how these beliefs can have dramatic effects on people. Some refuse modern medicine to the point of death, and others can become frozen with fear or convinced of death. Indeed, healthy people can die almost overnight, despite being in fine physical health. But back to the story. Hopping into this pit, I immediately felt uneasy. Looking about, I quickly spotted a human effigy made up of wound clear plastic on the floor. Attached to its waist was a scrap of blue material from a worker's overalls. I hesitated to touch it as many African superstitions believe walking over or coming into contact with such props brings the curse into effect. I can't say why, but it definitely seemed to emanate a rather sinister feel to it. I quickly scrambled out of the pit and headed out to the sunshine leaving the pit behind. Shortly afterwards, we made our way to the base of the mine to further explore. We ended up at the bottom of the shaft we had seen from above, and discovered a rather disturbing scene. Directly below the opening we had looked down from was a large dark brown stain, about five to six foot wide in radius. Shreds of blue overall material were there, and a large chunk of it was still intact, with a few various pieces of what seemed to be bone scattered around. We had very little light and were rather spooked by the scene, so we hightailed it out of there and never returned. I am confident this is the result of someone being killed and disposed of, or someone killing themselves due to the superstitious beliefs, like, I am cursed, therefore I will slash must die. Considering this area still had elephants roaming through occasionally, and the odd leopard sighting. You can see wildlife making a quick job clearing up the body after the deed. Make of it what you will. When I was 17 or so, two friends and I decided to camp in the field next to my housing estate so that we could drink beer and listen to music as loudly as we wanted to. This was a huge grassy field on a slight hill, where all the surrounding houses were far away enough so that they wouldn't disturb the neighbours, and we couldn't be seen by anyone unless they were extremely close to our tent. It became late, and my two friends had fallen asleep. I was having trouble sleeping around that time, so I would lay awake for hours just thinking. It was around 3am, when I heard the distinct sound of grass and vegetation, and someone walking around outside our tent. I was stunned with terror there, but more so because I hadn't heard anyone approaching. Just suddenly, there was someone outside the tent. 
I held my breath out of fear and shock, which is when I heard another set of footsteps belonging to the dog by the sound of it. Filled with dread, I just lay there as still as possible, breathing slowly and quietly, listening to this person and his dog walking outside back and forth on the tent. I thought we were going to get shot or beaten by this dude. Then I saw this guy's shadow, which freaked me out a hell of a lot more than I already was. It was huge and looming over us, and every time he passed our tent, I couldn't see the dog's shadow, even though I heard it making increasingly erratic situations of the tent. This carried on for another five minutes, although it felt like much more time had passed. The shadows disappeared, and the sounds faded away. They didn't leave or anything. It was more like they were still walking outside of the tent, but with perpetually lighter footing, and there was no threat for me to come outside. I freaked out at my friends, and said we had to go, because someone knew we were here and they didn't believe me thinking I had been asleep as well, and said that I had dreamt the whole thing. I assured them I haven't, and that we had to leave right now. They tried to get back to sleep, ignoring me, because they're lazy as hell, and didn't want to pack anything else up. So I gave up, even though I know that I'd never be able to sleep. Ten minutes later, the sound returned just like the volume outside had been turned up gradually. It felt like the same dread I had before, and whispered one of my friend's names so that they could actually hear, and shh, one lady said. They had already heard and told me to open the tent to see who was terrorizing us. I did so, slowly easing my hand out of the sleeping bag and up to the zipper. It probably took five minutes for me to reach it. It was so, so high, and I didn't want to make the sound. So I pulled it out so violently, I nearly ripped the bag in half. There was nobody there, and we got about a meter within the place of five seconds. And also, there was nobody nowhere. As I mentioned, we kept atop a hill in the middle of a field, and so could be seen by anyone who had decided to run. But there was nothing. Even though it was impossible for anyone to escape me seeing them, I'm absolutely positive there were no footsteps outside our tent that night. I worked in the Idaho backcountry for a summer doing vegetation work and weed spraying. My co-worker and I shared a wall tent 20 miles away from any human, and 60 miles from any town along a beautiful creek. We wouldn't see a soul for 10 or more days at a time. Part of our job was reading the journals of those who worked before us to get an idea past herbicide applications, whether weeds were last year and what kind. I often referred to the journal of one of the workers from the year prior, Andrew. According to his journal, he had to work a few days along, because his co-worker Amy got sick, and decided to pack out with some horsemen a few days before the hitch was over. The first day Andrew was alone, he saw a guy hiking who looked kind of ragged and dazed. His notes say that he looked super skinny, and was maybe in his 60s. He says his name was Ray, and that he was with a group, but Andrew hadn't seen anyone else, and Ray didn't have a backpack, but Andrew knew that there was a hunting camp 10 miles away, that sometimes had visitors, so they parted ways. The first night alone went well. Andrew enjoyed having time to himself, and took a creek bath and read his book. He had a productive next day, working, and decided to do a cool hike nearby that Amy wouldn't have done with him, but it took longer than expected. When Andrew got back to camp, it was dusk, and he saw the shadows from a fire flickering on the wall tent. He was confused. Had Amy come back? As he got closer, 
he saw that Ray was sitting there and had started a fire. Andrew asked what was going on, but Ray wouldn't speak and just kept staring at the flames. Andrew got out his radio and called the forest service, but it was too late on the evening for anyone to be on. He offered Ray some food, but he refused. It gets pretty cold there at night, so Andrew showed him to Amy's cot since she was gone, and they both fell asleep pretty quickly after that. According to Andrew's journal, he woke up in the middle of the night to Ray's screaming. He was naked on the cot, apparently having a night terror. He wouldn't wake up and was hysterical. He looked like a ghost. Andrew sat outside the rest of the night and dozed off. When he woke up, Ray was gone. He got a hold of the forest service and started walking around camp, keeping an eye out. Several hours later, a helicopter landed in the valley and a bunch of police and dogs jumped out. Apparently, Ray had escaped the Idaho State Prison and had wandered into the wilderness for a week, looking to get to Montana. I later learnt that it was common for escaped prisoners to try to hike up the drainage where we worked to get out of Idaho. And as you might expect, many of those prisoners were violent offenders with mental disabilities. And of course, Andrew had just written this nonchalantly in his journal for me to read, at night, in that very same wall tent a year later definitely was on alert for a few days after that. I'm an American born woman, but my mother was born in South Africa, having emigrated in the 90s. Growing up, she always taught me to be on guard and to be extremely cautious. It was simple things like driving up to an ATM at night. While my mom was using the machine, I had to look out of one window while my sister would look out of the other, so that we could see if someone was coming. I had always wanted to visit South Africa, and when I was 17 I went as a graduation present. I always ended up staying with my grandparents who were both in their late 70s. My grandmother was a hell bent on showing me as much of the country as possible, even though my grandfather had Alzheimer's and was worsening, and travelling was becoming harder. Regardless, we took off from Johannesburg towards Cape Town. We would drive for up to six hours at a time. Anyone who has been to South America knows that you can go hundreds of miles and see nothing but grass. But it was incredibly beautiful and eerie. Once we drove into wine country in the Cape, we began passing signs that said don't pull over for people selling grapes as we were near vineyards and people would steal grapes and then sell them on the side of the road. About hours three and four of the day, my grandfather was getting antsy. He was obsessing with the GPS in the car, plugging it in and re-plugging it in, cursing and getting furiated. Eventually the thing just kept repeating, recalculating for hours on end. My patience was wearing thin, and I was trying to take it from him so that I could fix it, but he wouldn't let me touch it. Finally, my grandmother had enough and pulled over so that he could give it to me. The stretched out road was narrow and lined by trees. It was probably mid afternoon, but we were the only car in sight and it was silent. My grandparents were reading the GPS instructions and arguing when my grandmother turns around, keep watching out of the back window. I kind of smiled to myself, remembering that's what my mum used to do. I glanced at my phone, which had no service, and scrolled through my camera roll for the 300th time that day. I casually looked up and turned towards the back window, and my heart stopped. A man had come out of the trees and was running at full sprint to our car. I found my voice and yelled, go to my grandmother and her instincts kicked in and we drove off. We drove away and the man was just left standing there. My grandmother explained that often when travelers pulled over for grape sellers, 
There would be people waiting in the trees who would come out and rob you, sometimes violently. It doesn't get much more vulnerable than a teenage girl and an elderly couple, one of which was suffering from Alzheimer's. Thank you, Vlam, for making me cautious. And I think I'm going to stay away from the forests from now on. I was working on a construction site, on a greenfield site in the UK, next to an elevated section of the M6 motorway in northwest England. Because of the proximity to the motorway during the main groundwork phase, we had to work at night, between midnight and 4am, as the motorway had to be closed for periods during work because there had to be vibration monitoring in place on the motorways. I was project manager, so was working night shift along with the construction crews, so I was mostly just milling around rather than working. And the job was small, so there was only around five of us on site, including me. It was winter, so it was a pretty miserable environment. One of the construction workers sent for a cigarette, and they came back, pretty quickly as white as a sheet, and they'd said that they'd heard a woman crying in her pyjamas in the woods. We all just laughed it off, but then someone else mentioned they thought they'd seen it, when standing in a farmer's field near the site, while he was driving to the site but didn't mention it, that it happened, and thought he was mistaken. So by this point, we're all starting to get pretty spooked. We turn on the main compound lights. We only had the immediate area lit up and had tan torches as we had restrictions on the amount of light that we could have during the next night working. And when we turned on the lights, we saw about five women wearing gowns and pajamas of various ages at the end of the light, not far from our side. And then they bolted into the woods that basically freaked out the group. A few of us went back to the main access track and followed it along the direction they had run off in. But we came across a spooky looking one lane wide tunnel and were basically like, screw going in there. The road was just a private access track and had no street lighting or anything. So it was pretty scary. So we packed up the cars and left the site straight away to return in the morning. After a bit of investigation the following day, we found out a little further along the road from the turn off from the site that it was a transitional rehabilitation unit for women. Basically a private specialist residential hospital for people recovering from physical and psychological brain trauma. Things like acute brain trauma caused by car clashes to serious cases of PTSD and schizophrenia. Acute bipolar, too. And other neurological issues, too. As they had friends who worked in the hospital and wondered at night what would make them select them. So, to start off, let me say that I am naturally jumpy. I'm really wary of my surroundings. I'm not a quiet or shy person trying to avoid people. I do, however, feel like I have a great sense of when someone's wrong or strange and will try to avoid it. I'm from a country in Europe where the murder or crime rate in general is very rare. So you can imagine that people aren't afraid to walk around alone. However, I rarely go out by myself at night just because I'm from a small town and the surrounding woods creep me out. When I'm with friends, however, I do enjoy the night strolls. So last week, me and my best friend went on our usual walk. We know the roads really well. We walk the same path every time and together we have a lot of fun. So we never think about scary things that could happen. The first three quarters of our path is well lit by street lamps and there are houses around. Not a lot of them, but they're there. Then we arrive at the tunnel 
and from then on there are no lights, and the asphalt road turns into a rocky slash pebble one. When we get to that spot, a white van is standing in front of the tunnel, to the side of a ditch that runs there. It's not turned on, and we're quite creeped out by it, but we just joke about how someone is going to follow us. When we pass, I mentioned that I thought I saw the silhouette of someone inside, but my friend gets angry at me for scaring her. After we cross the tunnel, the path turns left, and you have to walk uphill. It's not a long or hard walk before you come on top of that hill and have to go down again. From that point on, you are surrounded by woods on one side, and with open hop fields on the other. It's really dark, but we continue having a fun conversation for about five minutes or so, before the lights of something start shining from behind us, as there are a lot of farms about a mile or two ahead. So we move to the side and continue walking in order to let the car pass by. However, we look back and realize that it is not a car, but in actual fact, the white van from before. We kind of freaked out, but were hoping it would just pass. It didn't. We kept walking slowly for 50 to 100 meters, and the van is slowly trailing behind us. When we speed up, we hear it rev up as well, and when we slow down, the vehicle does the same. I nudge my friend on the shoulder, look straight at her in the eye and say, run to the field on the left, now. We both make a run for it as fast as we can, and we almost trip on the piles of soil because there are lots of them in the hot fields. We finally jump down and hide behind one of the bumps on the ground and wait. The van stops, turns on the strong headlights, and two men exit. They have hoods on, and they're each holding flashlights shining in our direction, scanning the fields. I think a minute or so passes, before they get back in the van, turn it around on the spot, and drive back from the direction we came from. We've never been this freaked out, and we just ran home through the field. The houses started again right by the end, so we felt safe when we got there. I don't know who these people were, and I've never been followed like this before, but I think we're going to be staying off the paths for quite some time now. This story took place in my parents' house. It's in the middle of nowhere, two kilometer radius of no other houses in the Black Forest. My mom and dad went out for a little partying with my uncle. Me, about eight, and my sister, about six, had to stay home. No big deal. We were home alone often, as my parents went out a lot. Eight-year-old me served some snacks and me and my sis watched TV in my parents' bed, which was on the upper floor. We loved to watch TV together, like all kids. After an hour or two, we fell asleep, and the TV went off automatically. Fast forward to the middle of the night, and someone is yelling help from outside my window, which happened to be open. I woke up immediately scared as hell, and I was completely awake at this point but unsure if this was actually happening. About 20 seconds later, my sister asked me if I'd heard that, and my heart sank into my back. It was real. I told her yes, and that it sounded like mum. She confirmed, both scared as hell and laying in my parents' bed, too scared to move, when another help came through. Fast as lightning, I ran to the window, leaving the safety of my bed. I shout out for my mum, but nobody responds. And my sister's asking me if my mum is outside, and what she was doing there. And then again, someone screams for help. I shout as loudly as I could, and ask if my mum is out there, but no one replies. I run back to my parents' bed, creeped out, scared, and my sister and I are crying a lot. The screams keep coming, 
and I told my sister to stay in bed as I began running downstairs to grab the phone and to call my mum or dad. I collect myself, ran downstairs, flying to pick up the phone and get back to bed. My heart is beating out of my chest. I call my mum for no answer and my dad doesn't pick up either. No one answers the phone. I hadn't heard from them since they'd stepped out the door. The screams persist. My sister and I never had the closest of relationships, but at this moment, we were stuck together and we were protecting each other and the house. We fell asleep in each other's arms, crying. Fast forward to the next morning of 8 a.m. We woke up and nobody was in the bed. Still scared, we walked down the stairs looking for our parents, but they weren't home. I told my sister to lay on the couch while I looked out the window, and I went to the kitchen window to look out, to see if there was a trail of blood or something, but nothing. I ran to my sister, and we waited on the couch to get a sign of my parents, and we didn't say anything. At 9am, they opened the door, completely exhausted, telling us there'd been a car accident in the night around the same time we heard the help screams. They couldn't answer their phones because the batteries had drained. My sister started to tell them what happened, and I already knew they wouldn't believe us. I swear that it really happened, and that it's 100% true. But to this day, they still think we made it up. I hope the person screaming for help was okay. I went on a backpacking trip with a friend when I was younger. We did a one week trip, backpacking a portion of the Appalachian Trail. At night, we would start a small campfire for cooking and heat. I can't even begin to explain how dark it was. There was no moonlight. It was literally pitch black. We were quietly sitting by the fire after dinner, crickets chirping and insect noises. Typical sounds you'd expect to hear in the woods. The noise was loud but not brutally loud, but loud enough that you'd notice it. We basically sat there and listened to the crackle of our fire and nature. All of a sudden, the symphony stopped on a dime. The only noise left was the crackle of our fire. Dead silence. It quickly went from relaxing to terrifying. Usually when an insect stops making noise, it's because there's a predator nearby when every insect stops making noise. That usually indicates a pretty big predator. Mix that with how dark it was. The light from our fire basically got swallowed by the darkness. Now how could this get worse? We start hearing footsteps in the woods around us and our camping area. Not running, but creeping. Whatever it was would walk a bit, then stop. Then walk a bit more, then stop. We couldn't see a thing. The words, we are being stalked, came out of my mouth. So now my friend and I are terrified. We are as close to the fire as you can get, without actually being in the fire. We both had sidearms, and it still didn't make me feel any better or safer. So the footsteps were getting closer. Not faster, just louder. So whatever was creeping around in the woods was now heading in our general direction. At this point I'm like, well, this is how it ends. So now you have two guys huddled around a campfire, waiting for something to come through a wall of darkness into the firelight and mold the crap out of us. Then, we finally met our fate. A very feminine voice sang, Hello, I'm friendly. We're coming towards you. And two wildlife biologists walked out of the darkness. They were studying bats. Obviously the best time to study bats would be at night. It was a man and a woman, and they sat with us for a few minutes and told us the entire process. It was really neat to listen to. They also wanted to let us know that they'd be out and about in our area for most of the night, and they didn't want to scare us too late. 
We chit-chatted for a couple more minutes, and then they went back on their way. After they were out of hearing distance, my friend and I looked at each other, and he said, I peed my pants to stay warm, not because I was scared. It's a known survival tactic. Up until I heard them say hello, I was honestly waiting for an angry Sasquatch to come charging out the woods, pick me up, and use me like a baseball bat to beat my friend to death. So my scariest experience in the woods was meeting two wildlife biologists. I used to live in a part of Memphis, Tennessee that was a little shaky. It was right on the edge of what some would call the ghetto. But also there was a nearby area that was pretty secluded and desolate as I lived on the outskirts of the city. Kind of near the industrial part near Raleigh for anyone familiar. I was an eight year old boy when this happened and my sister was five years my senior. The two of us went for walks on occasion. This time, we went to the back of the housing division and further than we'd ever gone before. This area was pretty dirty and desolate for such a city. Just train tracks and a nearby industrial facility. Lots of dry tan grass coming through spots in the railroad gravel. Lots of dusty crap people dumped illegally around the tracks. There used to be a pack of stray dogs that walked around my neighborhood. But other than that, no people or cars would really ever be seen out there. Not that far behind my neighborhood anyway. We were just walking along the tracks, talking, throwing rocks, when I saw some strange movement just beyond the tree line of this small wooded area, about 40 feet ahead, and on the left a bit. I told my sister to look, as we walked a bit closer. We had made it about 10 to 15 feet away from the woodland area, when we realized the movement was in fact a mine in the middle of nowhere, seemingly hidden amongst the trees and thick dead vines that adorned the edge of the wooded area. Painted face, black striped shirt with black pants. He had the exaggerated expressions of a mime too, his eyes got really wide as he seemed to start performing for us. He was kind of being way too into it. Maybe he was trying to attract us, perhaps entice us into the wooded area where he stood, or lurked for that matter. I honestly couldn't tell you much about him as we ran away quickly. I do remember, however, that it was very hot outside that day and his makeup was pretty dingy and gross as were his clothes. I know this sounds pretty unbelievable, but I assure you, it happened. I sometimes wonder who the mime was. I'm sure he wasn't there to kidnap children, but who knows what would have happened if we'd have gone into that thicket? And why there? He was just simply insane, I think. His mind gone, which is far more creepy than any stranger I have read about. I was in Denali National Park two years ago, with my now wife and two other friends. If you aren't familiar with it, it is a trailless wilderness. That means that there aren't trailheads or marked trails. And if you find social or game trails, you are encouraged to avoid them to keep the wilderness as pristine as possible. You give a backcountry permit to a unit, which is a large division of the park and has a limited number of campers in it. You get on the bus that goes to one of the roads through the park and drops you off when it is going through access to your assigned unit. Then it drives away and you're in the middle of nowhere. It is amazing and intimidating at the same time. Anyway, we backpack for two amazing days and have yet to see any wildlife other than the local ptarmigans. On the morning of the last night, the others are drinking coffee 
and we are preparing to break camp. I'm looking down in the river valley that our campsite has a view of. We hadn't seen other humans for 48 hours, and I think I see some campers hiking through the brush in the distance. I call out, and the hikers turn out to be a bull moose who pops his head up and looks at us. We then start watching him, and he walks along the river and slowly makes his way towards our camp. He's not coming here, I say to the group. Well, he was. He climbed the hill and walked right into our campsite. We gave him a wide berth as he approached, as moose are the only animals you run from in Denali, as they can be aggressive. He froze and eyeballed us for a while, then continued up the side of the mountain. It was scary as hell, but he was a majestic beast. Anyway, it starts pouring on us as we are finishing breaking camp, and we decide to save some time by following a game trail for a bit, as we were soaked and cold. This saved us a lot of time bushwhacking through alders and whatnot. Well, we round a corner, and the trail comes to a dead end, in what was the remains of a bear kill site. The bones of a moose, flattened down brush, old scat. Let me tell you, that's an unnerving feeling. We freeze, the blood drains out of our faces, and we look at each other and instantly agree to double back a bit, and start our bushwhacking again, to get out of dodge. It was an epic trip, and I highly recommend it if you have any backpacking experience. If not, camp near the ranger station is also nice to do some day hikes. My father is an avid outdoorsman, and when I was a kid I tagged along. One night we were out driving to a hunting site in the middle of nowhere. We were driving down an old road and we hadn't passed another car in quite a while. We were coming up on a pasture, and we could see a perfect circle of individual blue lights sitting out there on the ground, in the middle of this grazing pasture. It's hard to say how big the circle was, but I'd say it was at least the size of an average house. It was very unusual, just in itself. We were like, what the hell is that? Then exactly as we drive by, all of the lights turn off in a sequence around the circle. It was chilling. My dad doesn't get scared or edgy very easily. He immediately took us home a different way than we'd come, and we didn't drive back that way. He knew who owned the land and called the guy and he had no idea what it was, and was just as weirded out as we were. On another night, we were driving back from hunting in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. As we were going along, we come upon this woman, walking along this side of the road. Every hair I have stood on end, and there was just something not right about the situation, besides the obvious. It was an older woman dressed in old-time clothes. That wasn't all the crazy, though, because we were in a very rural part of West Texas, with a large population of Mennonites, as well as country people, who did dress that way. I could tell my dad was put off, but he was not going to just let some lady wander desolate roads in the middle of the night. He pulls up to the woman, but she keeps walking. He rolls down my window and asks her if she needs any help. She didn't reply in any way whatsoever. It was as if we weren't there at all. It was scary as hell. He kept trying, but there was nothing. So we took off in a hurry. Finally, on another occasion, we were out in the woods. I think we could have been checking traps and walking to a hunting blind on a lease. Anyway, we were walking along through the woods, 
and I just happened to look to my right, and there was a clearing through the trees that went on for a ways, almost like a path. If you spent a lot of time in the woods, I'm sure you'd know what I mean. So I look out to my right, and I swear I saw a big hairy ape walk across that clearing in maybe one or two steps. That was the scariest thing. I still question whether it happened, or I hallucinated it. I mean, it was that scary, and surreal. This story happened to my girlfriend. Her and a few friends, two gals and a guy, went camping to a remote place in the woods for fun. It was like a little turnout near a random forest service road. The guy friend, who I will refer to as Manly Man, was actually a scaredy twip and hated sleeping in the woods, but for whatever reason loved being out there. In order to alleviate his fears, he brought a dose of sleeping aid, either Ambien or OTC Benadryl. I can't remember which. Fast forward to around dusk, they're enjoying a fire and generally jesting, when a truck rolls up, lifted, loud, you know the type. One guy gets out the passenger truck door, and another stays in the cab. They want directions to somewhere that no one's ever heard of, and want to use a phone since they have no service. After being told no one else has service, he proceeds to ask questions like, Just you four up here? Did you know there were bears? There aren't any in Oregon Valley. Are you carrying protection from wild animals? Rather annoying and innocuous stuff, until... Fast forward again to the middle of the night, when Manly Man is thoroughly knocked the hell out, and headlights pop up in the road. An engine rolls closer, my girlfriend wakes up spooked, and the engine stops and the headlights cut. There's no noise for a few minutes, then rustling. My girlfriend wakes up, they all start freaking out, and are trying to rouse the Manly Man. Eventually he wakes up, Groggily agrees that this rustling is real, and he's a bit nervous. They listen for a while longer, and after the noise gets closer they start shouting, Who's there? And receive no reply, and the rustling stops. Needless to say, they threw their camping stuff in the back of the truck, and got the hell out. They passed the same truck, a bit down the road with no one inside. Either those two pricks were playing a prank, or legit up to some shitty, shady things. But either way, not how you want to be woken up in the middle of nowhere. They ended up crashing at Manly Man's house in the living room, and playing Risk the next day. This didn't happen to me, but my grandpa. My family owns a chunk of land about an hour outside of Yellowstone National Park. It's very beautiful, but very remote. We go up there every summer for a few weeks, but my grandpa lives there for the whole summer. So, he does most of the upkeep around the property, maintaining fences, oiling the cabin, and clearing out dead trees. So, decades ago, way before I was born, my grandpa was out on the property, replacing parts of the fence. He did the work alone, but always brought his German Shepherd Scout along with him for company. So my grandpa is finishing up his work, and it's approaching dusk, when he hears Scout whining. He looks up, the dog is alert and just staring into the woods. He didn't think too much of it and guessed he probably just smelled a grouse or some other small animal. So my grandpa finishes packing up his tools, and is ready to head out to the cabin. He calls Scout, but he won't move. He's staring into the woods. My grandpa literally has to grab Scout by the scruff, and turn him around before they start heading down the trail. You have to understand that Scout was a good dog, and always listened to my grandpa so ignoring commands was very abnormal. 
So they're walking down the trail. It's only about a 10 minute walk to the cabin, but it's through some of the thickest forest on the property, and it's getting dark fast. The whole time my grandpa said he felt a growing sense of unease, like he was being followed. Scout would stop every few steps and turn around and growl, staring into the trees. My grandpa would stop sometimes to look out but never saw anything. This continued the whole way home. They finally reached the clearing where the cabin was built. And obviously my grandpa is relieved. He gets to the front door and Scout is next to him, barking like mad at the trail they just left. So my grandpa looks over one more time and he finally sees it. On the edge of the clearing, staring right back at him, is a mountain lion. Scout is long gone, but my grandpa swears that dog saved his life. Mountain lions like to ambush their prey, but Scout likely prevented that from happening. I was driving home from shopping. My mum was with me. It was somewhat dark in the middle of winter in Minnesota. We're somewhat out in the country. And there are road lights and medians, but not a ton of them. All of a sudden, this giant dog slash wolf thing leapt across the road about 25 feet in front of our car. It was a four lane road with a median. It made it landing once on the median and jumping again from there. The car's headlights, as well as the lights of the light pole, didn't penetrate it. It was pure black. It was like a shadow from within. It wasn't a deer. It was far too large for that. And the body shape was that of a wolf, or a large dog. And it wasn't a moose for the same reasons, and definitely not a bear. Whatever it was, it was large enough that the bottom of its chest would have stood above the hood of the suburban we were in. As teenagers, when we go hang by the river and drink late at night, I stressed that it was a small neighborhood and where we went, no one else went. I'd bet only the three of us knew. That number includes all the kids, including myself in the neighborhood. Multiple times we all saw at the same time, something humanoid, but distinctly not at the same time, watching us from the edges of the woods near our small clearing. We'd all hear voices as well, not from people living around there, and not a ton specifically, but just voices. One of the oddest happenings was when we were all about 15. We dragged an old couch to that hangout spot. It almost took us five hours. We hung out in the woods that night, but we were out until about 2am, heading back to one of our homes to set up a LAN and game a bit. About three hours later, someone realized they'd left something back there. And for the hell of it, as dawn was breaking, we all went with them. The couch, which was a sleeper and supremely heavy, was gone. Just gone. No drag marks other than the ones that we'd made, and no signs of a vehicle or anywhere else. How it had managed to disappear in that short time is still a mystery to us to this day. My family camped in the same place every year. Awesome campsites. And it was surrounded by miles and miles of forest. Anyway, a couple of kilometers from the main area, we find this barbed wire fence. And being boys, we had to get over it. But at the time it was far too tall. So we dug under it with my father's old tactical shovel. A fold-out shovel with a blade in one side. Anyway, we finally squeeze under, and we make our way into the forest. 
We walk for about 20 minutes, and when we don't see anything, we stumble upon a river. It was the middle of summer, and the river was running low. So we climb down the bank and decide to follow the river, because we had nothing better to do. We follow the river for a while, until we come across a strange sight. A very old, very rusty, Volkswagen Beetle, half buried in the bank, partially sunk into the riverbed. The front end was punched in, and the seats were ripped apart, and all the glass was missing. The weirdest thing was that there was this giant hole punched through the roof. The metal was bent outwards, like something had punched through from the inside of the car. The doors were rusted shut, but with our handy pocket knives and my dad's old tactical shovel, we ripped over the driver's side door. The other was sunk into the muck and inaccessible, and inside there was one leather shoe, still tied, just sitting there. It was super creepy, and thinking about it now, I'm pretty sure something very messed up happened. But as a kid, it was super cool and creepy. We never told anyone about it, and we returned to see it every year when we went camping, bringing our friends along and such. The last time we went to see the car, it was pretty much gone, totally sunken into the mud. The creepiest thing though, honestly, was that there were no roads for miles around, and it was all forest. Something I constantly pondered was how the hell it got into the riverbed in the first place, and where the hell the original driver went. I love caving. Absolutely love it. I even joined a caving club. They send you an information pack once a month about featured cave tours. One month. They sent out a packet containing a 7-8 hour wild man caving tour. I've been on wild man cave tours before, they're not too difficult, maybe some rappelling or mid climbing, but nothing over an hour. This one had a real danger climb, too much to the right and you get stuck, slip too far and you can fall in a hole. Getting rescued in a deep cave is basically impossible. There were five of us, three tour guides, me and another person. About halfway through the cave, they let us rest on this off shallow ridge thing that was right next to the biggest drop off in the cave. The guides told us how with the larger groups they did the typical total darkness and had everyone turn off their headlamps and just look around. When he motioned us to follow suit, we did. And after about 30 seconds, there was this sound. It honestly sounded like footsteps, and then falling rocks, and finally a screech. Immediately the head guide flipped on his headlamp and looked at us with a panicked glint. I think he thought one of us had fallen or jumped off the cliff. He turned to the other two guides and asked if they'd heard it. They did, but couldn't explain it. They hadn't moved, and we were all still there. He radioed to the surface and asked if anyone on the normal tours was missing. This was about three hours away from the start of the wild man path, and without our headlamps, it was literally like staring into a wall of black. There was no way an experienced or an inexperienced caver would have made it this far. The guides asked us if we wanted to continue with the experience and would understand and refund us if we decided not to. We went along, and eventually completed the tour. Everything else went perfectly normal. But I don't know what that could have been. It wasn't animal footsteps, and that screech was blood chilling. I was in Ruidoso, New Mexico, about 12,000 feet elevated, just staring at the stars outside my home. I can get lost in the stars for hours. It was about midnight, 
and I noticed a green glow coming from deep in the forest. Mind you, everything is dark, and everybody is sleeping up here. It would pulsate on and off again. I wanted to check it out, but didn't dare in the night. Must have been at least 20 to 30 yards away. Then time passes, and I see some lights dancing in the sky, moving up and down the side. I started to put my focus on that, then went on for over an hour. They started low, and slowly made their way higher. Well, this part, mind you, scared the hell out of me. Out of nowhere, it pulsated a lime green colour. So strong, I could make out it's an aircraft of some kind. Not your typical aircraft, but an oval one, with windows running all around it. It was like the sides were all glass. The crazy thing is, the green glow was the same one I'd seen earlier in the forest. Some time passes, and I'm just sitting there taking it all in, hoping no bear or wild animal comes and attacks me in the night. And above me I see this huge craft. I had my camera on me, ready to take pictures of whatever. But in that moment, I felt like I froze and couldn't move. I'd never seen this craft as well. First, it was all black, apart from the red circle shaped lights on the back. It must have been about four to five lights. Second, it was moving slow, like hovering at slow speeds. Lastly, it was shaped like a triangle. No lie. It was way too low for an aircraft. And above me, I was shitting bricks. I couldn't even call my folks while I was in awe of whatever it was. I know this sounds highly unlikely, but I wouldn't waste my time sharing this just for the hell of it. This happened 10 years ago. It could have been military, or an exotic aircraft that they're creating, but I really don't know. Nonetheless, I was amazed and terrified seeing it. I was stalked by a mountain lion once. It was the late 90s, and I will never forget the feeling of being potential prey. My boyfriend at the time and I wanted to hike in this area, in the desert, called Hellhole Canyon. Despite the name, it was a gorgeous place to hike, but far into the desert. It was early spring because the plants were still green, and there was water running in the stream, later in the year, because everything dies up and turns brown. It had just rained too, because there were rain puddles on the trail. I saw a big print, it looked like a large dog, but no claws. Keep in mind that just like house cats, big cats have retractable claws, so that told us to be careful. But we continued to hike, because it was a loop trail. Just when we got to the part of the loop that was the furthest from the trailhead, I bent down and saw some tiny paw prints that looked just like the others, except little. I started gushing about how cute they were, and that the babies must be somewhere. Then we heard the growl. It sounded almost like a rumble engine, like dirt bikes or something off in the distance. But it was not a dirt bike, and it was close. All of a sudden I realised that the birds that were previously chirping around us were dead silent. I stood up and took off my backpack to hold it above my head to make myself look larger, and told the boyfriend that we were leaving now. He heard the same thing, so he was already looking for a rock. There weren't any good hiking sticks in the area. Neither of us saw the animal, but we knew she was there. We both got big, and made loud noises, and walked away, as quickly away from there as possible. I kind of think that if the mama cat wasn't busy with her new kittens, or if I were hiking alone, we would have been live bait. It's part of the reason I don't ever hike alone, ever. 
It's too easy to get caught by animals that usually leave people alone if there is more than one. About three months ago, my wife, then fiance and I, were driving from Oregon to Arizona. We were in a part of Nevada that was in the middle of nowhere. We were on the end of a 70 mile stretch with no cell service at midnight. My wife is a small girl, only five foot one and a hundred pounds. I often joke when I go to see her at work, oh, it must be take your child to work day. She's that small. It was my wife's turn to drive at this point. So I was reclined in my seat, out of view, sleeping. She shakes me awake and says, this guy's been following me on my ass for a while. I don't know what his issue is. I glance behind to see a big, F-350, only about 10 feet behind us. I tell her to speed up, figuring he was just wanting us to go faster, but he keeps the same distance from us at all times. All of a sudden, he shoots into the oncoming lane, overtakes us, and then proceeds to slow in front of us, bringing his and our speed to only 10 miles an hour. She backs off a considerable distance when he slams on his brakes and starts opening his door. At this point, I sit up all the way. I am a pretty big guy and I roll my window down. When he spots me, he slams his door shut and takes off. I'm not one to jump to conclusions, but I feel that the guy didn't see me. He would have definitely tried to take my wife. It shook us up pretty badly. And at the next gas station, we found the attendant and called it in. Luckily, I got his plate numbers. And that's why you don't drive in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere. You never know who is out there. I spend weeks alone in the woods by myself, and I used to go on group camping trips about two weekends a month for 10 years. I was born into camping and love it. Most of my outings are trips to the Akala National Forest in Florida and other state slash national parks. Most odd occurrences are with other people and animals and I've stumbled into neo-Nazi rallies and clan gatherings several times. Multiple interactions with the odd hunter and their tracking dogs. However, last year finally opened my eyes to the dangers of being alone. I was heading to my usual spot in Akala, a free primitive campground next to a secondary creek, and noted a Department of Corrections bus the officer there stopped me and briefly inquired about my reason for being there. I asked what was going on, because I was going to be camping in the area. He said a body was discovered by the road, and was linked to a case in the area, and the prisoners were there to search the area. The case was being built for a local man linked to the murder. I left the scene and went home, rather than camping, thinking the entire time about last year when I was alone in my tent and heard footsteps outside. Assuming it was a bear, I pulled the side of my handgun loud, just enough for it to be heard. But rather than an animal noise, it was the whispered hush of a man's voice, laughing. I think I may have avoided being part of that case. The man was arrested for something and then linked to a ton of the murders in the area and he is still serving time in prison. This happened earlier this summer. I was on vacation with my cousin. We were both 16, as well as my uncle in upstate New York, pretty much Canada. 
We had a pretty nice house, along with a small cabin on the same property that my cousin and I were staying in by a lake. That was really nice and in the middle of nowhere. It was about 40 minutes to the nearest gas station. On our part slash section of the lake, there were two other houses, one about half a mile away from us and the other even further than that. Our house is right up on the lake, but with a small section of the forest that we have to walk through. About five feet of trees from the yard to the water to get to the dock. The trees are right up against the water with no beach. My cousin and I decide to go sit on the dock at around midnight. We're sitting on the dock for 20 minutes, when we heard loud crunching footsteps in the trees about five yards to the left of the dock in the trees, right on the shoreline. It could only have been a bear, deer or human, judging from the sound. My uncle had a chihuahua, so that was out of the question. We wanted to sprint inside, but didn't in case it was a bear or moose that would chase us. So we stayed out on the dock to try and see what it was. The footsteps stopped for a bit. As we were trying to look past the trees, a flashlight shined out from the trees and onto us. We booked it inside, where we saw my uncle and dog sitting on the couch. We searched the whole property and couldn't find anyone or anything. And I still have no idea who it was. A few years after my father had graduated from CSU, and my mother had graduated from TCU, they both had jobs at a small company in Fort Worth, Texas. Having met at a few company parties, and hitting off things a few years later, they finally got married, and my father got a job in Colorado for a small but growing engineering company. So off they pack and move from Fort Worth, Texas to Colorado. Getting in a car with their few belongings, they start to make their way there. Now I'm not sure why they took the road they did, but instead of a larger interstate highway, my mother and father decided to take a smaller, not so traveled highway on their final stretch back to my father's hometown to catch Highway 14 to their new home. Having driven all day, and it being the middle of the night, my father had the idea of pulling off to the side of the road to sleep for a few hours, before waking up and finishing out the journey. Bear in mind, there were no rest stops on this highway, so it was either side of the road or nowhere to rest. My mother agreed, but maybe 20 minutes after stopping and trying to get sleep, my mother didn't feel comfortable and decided instead of sleeping here, she would drive while my father rested and when he woke up, she would rest while he took over. Just to reiterate, this is a not so traveled highway, so there are no lights and my parents are in the middle of nowhere and the nearest city or town is miles away. Not a mile or two down the road, my mother notices something on the side of the road, and she gets closer and notices it is just a single man in the middle of nowhere, with no lights or anything, just walking on the side of the road in the direction of where my parents were just parked. There were no broken down cars further up the road, and there was nothing in miles to justify why this man would be walking on the side of the road. My parents don't bring it up much, but they have wondered what would have happened if they both fallen asleep in their car on the side of the road that night. About 10 years ago, I lived in Virginia with my then girlfriend, who was working on an internship there. We're pretty outdoorsy type and would periodically go to hike in various places around where we lived. I can't remember exactly where it was, to be honest, 
Uh, we had driven out into the middle of nowhere in order to hike a particular nature reserve. To get there, we drove a long ways down a windy country back road. And then the final bit was on a one lane dirt road to the trailhead. Driving down the dirt road, there was nothing but pasture land for several miles. Some empty, some full of cows. It was rather remote, sparsely populated. And I would guess that we passed perhaps two to three houses, or their driveways anyway, in total. Probably a thousand acres per house kind of deal. We hiked, uneventfully, and got in the car to drive back home near sunset. The landscape was such that there were a lot of tiny rolling hills. So we were driving up and down frequently. As we crested one of these hills, we both saw a white 50s ish farm truck barreling down the road towards us at somewhat of an alarming speed. Given the diminished visibility, and the fact that it was a literally one lane road with nowhere in sight to pull off, my girlfriend was driving and we were both like, Oh crap, that guy's driving really fast. And we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. She slowed down in anticipation. And we waited for the truck to arrive. As we waited, we did a couple more up and down the hills while nervously looking for the truck, which had to be on us at any second by this point. Only the truck never arrived. It was the weirdest thing. We both saw it. We were both nervous about it hitting us. And the damn thing just disappeared. We hadn't passed any driveways. And once we realized the truck was gone, I kept my eye out for a driveway. Because that would explain it. But nope, nothing. The truck was simply gone. I am normally a logical person, but I have no explanation other than I think we saw a ghost truck. I went to Moonville when I was in college in Nelsonville. We decided at around 10pm to go in search for this tunnel and arrived at about 1045. Unaware of the parking lot and bridge that led right to it, we parked a few miles down the road on an old railroad track and path. Our friend promised he knew the way from there. And we followed the walking path that just stops at a very steep embankment in almost 90 degrees. We all climb down and then come to Raccoon Creek and cross a shallow part. We wandered around for a bit roughly till midnight trying to find the tunnel and anything particularly paranormal or out of the ordinary. When all of a sudden, we're in a canyon type deal. And everything in the middle of it is dead. Trees, birds, insects, nothing was living. Animal corpses covered the canyon thing. One end was a cliff about 35 feet down. And I'm not sure what was there. When we found our way out of the canyon, it was like we just exited a different world. Everything was living again and you could hear the birds. Thinking to ourselves, we thought we had only spent 30 minutes in there. So we checked our phones, which were our flashlights, and almost dead. It was 3am. Knowing this was the witching hour, we all started to freak out a bit, knowing there were cults and sacrificial rituals being performed out in the woods. Not knowing where we were, as we were trying to use the maps on our phones, there was no service though, so it wasn't much help. But they started to die one by one, until we get to the last bit of battery on the last phone. And we find the one lane gravel road and get to our vehicles, and get the hell out of there. Since then I have only been back once, and it was in the daytime after finding out about the bridge. Definitely one of the more creepy experiences I've had down there, and I haven't been back to that spot since.
I worked for the country agriculture department one summer. My co-workers and I drove out to the orchards to put up some insect experiments. Sometimes the locations were pretty far from civilization. This one particular walnut orchard was about an hour away from a very small town. It was scraggly looking, not very well managed, lots of weeds and diseased trees, which made it good for insect research, because there were so many. The trees were big and old. The place put out a very uneasy creepy feeling. None of us liked visiting that orchard. We always rushed in to change the bug traps and rushed out so we didn't spend any more time than we had to. One day, the three of us are driving to it, when we make the final turn into the property. There's a cop car blocking the middle of the road, with a police do not cross tape stretched across the dirt road. We park, get out, explain to the officer what we're doing there and ask what's going on. There's a dead body in the orchard. He asks if there's anything we know about it. No, we just got there. He says they're investigating, and it might take a week. Fine by us. We called our boss and told him we weren't going back to that place. Here's the kicker. We were late to getting to the orchard that day. Had it been our first stop in the morning like it usually was, we would have stumbled across that body. Or maybe even the event that caused it. I grew up on the New Mexico Reservation. I'm white, and my stepfather is Navajo. Anyway, it's really rocky desert and a mountain-like area. Like the Grand Canyon, but smaller. No white people go out there. The Navajos back there and then really hated white people. You can walk all day and never see anyone. I was on my horse hunting and came to this circle-like depression in the sandstone and sand like someone had made it a long time ago. There was no sound from animals around it, no lizards on the rocks, no birds humming. It was scaring the crap out of my horse. He was screaming and jumping and kicking, and I couldn't get him to calm down. So I got away from there and tied him up to a pinion tree in sight. I went to check it out with a weapon, of course. It was just a big circle about a foot deep, and it looked like something was built there, but very long ago. I came back with friends, and with horses and dogs. The horses did the same things, and the dogs just stayed on the top of the hill whining. No one had any idea what it was, but when we told our parents, we were told to stay away from it. The only thing I could find out was that the Navajos and other Indians would put people and children who could not contribute to the tribe in a pit-like circle to die from the elements. A long time ago, if you were crippled or mentally challenged, and couldn't hunt or farm, no one was going to support or take care of you. In the early 70s and 80s, growing up, I had hours of chores every day, even though I was going to school too. Exploring out there was amazing, and I've seen things that no one would believe. I was hunting in the middle of Missouri with my uncle and dad. We were about four miles from the truck and 30 miles from civilization. I was sitting at the campfire while my uncle and dad went to get more firewood. I had a gun sitting next to me. I was cooking some fish we caught in a nearby pond on the fire and was close to dozing off. I heard footsteps and looked up to see a guy in orange walking towards me with a smile on his face that looked off. He began about 25 yards from me and I couldn't wake out why he was wearing all safety orange. I shouted at him and asked if he needed help. He began to walk faster, and that's when I saw his limp. His right pant leg was covered in blood, and the fabric was torn. He kept walking towards me, 
and I picked up my gun and pumped it. He kept right on going, and I pissed my pants. He was about 15 feet from me before I heard shit. My uncle had just dropped a piece of wood in his foot and yelled. The guy immediately turned and ran into the woods. Turns out he escaped from prison earlier that day and was found dead in the woods, half eaten by animals a few days later. We left as soon as they got back. My friends and I all wanted to visit an abandoned school because we thought it would be very creepy and fun. We drive and once we get there, we see a full blown bonfire and thought that they were kids like us looking for a creepy night out. We were wrong. Apparently it was a gang initiation going on. They stopped us, asked if we had any drugs, alcohol or money. The driver, my best friend, was frozen with fright and they tried to pull him out of the driver's seat. I was sitting behind him and trying to talk some sense into him to get the car to drive off. No dice. He sat there frozen. A huge gangster put his hand into the car and tried to unlock my door. I blocked his hand and he immediately started punching the window. Finally, my best friend kicked into gear and slammed the car into reverse and put the pedal to the metal. I was so relieved. For a few seconds, everything was in slow motion. He even hit the guy trying to get the door open. Then he hit a boulder behind us. The car jerked and came to a stop. And luckily the car didn't hit a ditch and we sped off. We were so lucky. The path to the abandoned school was on a mountain road and we couldn't have easily fallen into a ditch when he was heading back. We laughed about it, but my friend had to replace his door and his trunk. My father owns a large property in rural Australia. About 10 years ago, he had a horse die out in one of the paddocks right next to thick scrubs that surrounds a river running through his property. He dragged the horse with a tractor under a tree and covered it with a heap of branches, intent on burning it later. He forgot about the horse and it was left there to rot and it's nothing but a pile of bones now. We remembered this happened 10 years ago and it's an old dried out horse skeleton completely covered by sticks, leaves and branches. You wouldn't even be able to see it. When two weeks ago, dad went to check out the paddock and he noticed something strange. Something or someone had taken the horse skull and a lot of the larger leg bones and stacked them up in a pile closer to the scrub, almost about 50 meters away from where it originally was. What could it have been? There haven't been any people out there as far as he knows of. Scavengers like foxes wouldn't be interested in a pile of old bones. And even if they were, they couldn't drag heavy bones and stack them in a neat pile. It's a total mystery. In Idaho, there's this natural hot springs up on top of a mountain. It's at the end of a dirt road and up a trail. It's not very well known. A buddy and I decided to spend a few days camping up there. So we set up camp at the trailhead. While we're making dinner, we see a car pull up and four kids in their 20s get out, all dressed in swimwear. They walk past us and wave, then head up the trail. A few hours go by and it's probably 6 p.m and starting to get dark in winter. So my buddy and I grab a bottle of scotch and head up the trail, fully expecting to join the other group in the hot springs. We get up there and there's no one in the hot springs. Sandals and towels all strewn about the area, but no people. We thought it was weird, but figured they all went into the woods to collectively pee or something. We spent two hours in the springs and never saw any signs of them. We went back to camp at 1am 
and their car was still there. We woke up in the morning and the car and clothes were gone. No idea what they were doing though. I went quail hunting about 10 years ago with my stepdad and his friend. It was kind of in the middle of nowhere next to Colorado River on the California side. We thought we were alone and one night we hear this girl screaming in the distance. It startled us, so we grabbed our shotguns and walked towards the screaming. We rolled up on this camp about a quarter of a mile away, and it's this guy, and we presumed his girlfriend. She is visibly distraught. He about craps his pants when three guys roll up with shotguns. He asks if everyone is okay and she was looking at the ground and said she was fine, and that they were having an argument. The next morning we wake up at 4am to start the day's hunt, and we walk past their camp to check on them again. They're gone. We never heard them leave. I hope that girl was okay. When I was 13, my parents and I took a trip to Yellowstone National Park. While hiking a trail, we heard a huge crash and a loud scream. Watch out! Were the words yelled from someone not in sight on the trail ahead. Hundreds of buffalo appeared crashing through the trees coming towards us. Executing our natural fight or flight response to this dismal turn of events, we ran as fast as we could through the woods. I tripped at one point and remember screaming out to my mother who was already there to help me out. My father yelled at us to follow him as he started running up the hill on the other side of the path. Five seconds later, we saw the herd of buffalo passing us. Turns out if you ever are being chased by a herd of buffalo, you should run up a hill because the herd will naturally go downhill. We went to a diner right after that for lunch and I ordered a buffalo burger and it gave me a sense of victory. There is an ice road in northern Alberta that's only open for three to four months of the year when the rivers freeze over. Anyway, I took to the road rather than flying up a remote community where I was working for a project. It was bizarre. First of all, there's no lights except for your vehicles. It's crazy for your GPS to be like, I have no idea, man. I think you're in a river. Anyway, I pulled over to take a leak. It was in the evening, so you couldn't see much. Midstream, I had a weird danger shudder and jumped back into my truck. About 15 seconds later, I saw a couple of lynx, or minks, coming down and strolling as they were sniffing around my truck. They aren't huge, but I have no doubt they could have taken me down. So I ended up peeing in an empty bottle. My parents lived out in the country for a time. So as a kid growing up, it was really easy to get paranoid at night. All those wide open spaces and dark woods can seem ominous. But eventually you just get sort of used to it and tune it out. My sister and I would sometimes fall asleep in the living room watching a late night TV program. Sometimes I would wake up to the sounds of footsteps on our deck in the dead of night, when no one would have been outside. My sister would sometimes see a shadowy figure for a brief moment, which always seemed to draw nearer when she could see it again. Eventually, whatever it must have been entered the house, because one day I closed every door in the entire house as it was a very large single story ranch house to keep our dog from getting into certain areas. When I came home, every single door on the inside of the house was wide open, along with the door I exited when locking up. I was worried there was a home intruder, but nothing else was missing. <laughs> 